Hey everyone, and welcome to the Cross-Platform Mobile Development Summit 2020. We're so excited to have uh, all of you here with us. And we believe this is gonna be an amazing experience for all of us. And uh, we want to say thank you to, uh, to the community who supported us for both community to both communities, Flutter and React Native. And we want to say a special word of thank you to our speakers and especially to our program community, hey, those who helped us and helped us and summit twenty twenty. We're so excited to have uh, all of you here with us. We want to say big thank you to uh, to the team, to the amazing team who uh, actually helped us and uh, it was more than 40 people who were involved in organizing of this event. And uh, we, uh, I want to say thank you personally to uh, those guys who support us through uh, buying senior uh, track tickets because guys, you're the ones who are basically funding this whole event right now. You are the ones who's, uh, who's the main sponsors for us. And um, just a couple of words about the idea of the summit. So we see the mobile development community as a as a big house with many rooms. And today we wanted to focus just on two technologies. It's going to be Flutter and React Native, or React Native and Flutter, uh, depending on on the camp you're for. And uh, so we we want to start this as a as an event with two technologies, and then later. Uh, this year or maybe in the beginning of the next year, we will see. We will have uh, two separate events for uh, Flutter and React Native Key Studies. And uh, yeah, basically it's going to be a dedicated event. And for those of you guys who may be um, involved in development in any other frameworks, we, we think this is going to be an awesome intro. And you will learn about the technologies, both React Native and Flutter. and you will be able to make an informed decision if you want to actually switch to something different. And um, uh, just a couple of words about the upcoming events that we will have uh, later uh, later this month. We, on 19th of November, we will have uh, Python for Web uh, Summit. And uh, we will be glad to welcome all of you uh, there and we will be more than happy to uh, to see you there. And uh, in case if you have submitted a CFP form for um, for this uh, event uh, previously, and uh, you, um, for some reason, you, you are not among the speakers right now for this event, we will have CFP for upcoming events for React Native and Flutter uh, later today. And also we will have a promo codes for, uh, for the upcoming events, which is uh, Python. And Later this year or in the beginning of the next year, we will have uh, the event about solution architecture. And also we will have uh, case study festivals for, for our other technologies. And uh, yeah, so briefly wanted to thanks once again to the program committee who did an amazing job. It was our pleasure to work with you guys and special word of thank you to, uh, to the community to those who supported us, to those who shared the promo codes, those who made announcements in uh, in, in the chats. And uh, I guess we have like a couple of minutes before the, uh, before, it, before the first speaker uh, on both tracks. We'll start on senior track. Here with us, we will have Roy Derks. And let's have a couple minutes pause and we will start shortly, like in two or three minutes. It was my pleasure to be one of the organizers here. And also Anna, uh, who's the community manager of this event, she is behind the scene right now. She's preparing everything. She's, she's the one who's uh, basically taking care about our speakers, about the, the, the stage, the, the podium uh, that we're presenting in today. So thank you very much. And uh, I'll talk to you a little bit later. I will be moderating one of the tracks uh, this night. It's my pleasure uh, to talk to you. It's my pleasure to to be engaged in this amazing event. Thank you.
Hi everyone, my name is Anna and I'm happy to welcome you on the junior track of Cross-Platform Mobile Development Summit. I will be a host for the next couple of hours, so if you have any technical issues, please inform me about them in chat. Also, remind you that questions for speakers are always awaited. So, it's time to present our first speaker and open our React Native block. So please meet, meet Roy Dirks, who is a startup CTO developer and a conference speaker from Amsterdam. Currently, uh, he is leading the engineering teams at Van de Braun on a mission to provide the world with renewable energy. Today, Roy will present the topic, learn once, write anywhere. This quote has been used for React Native for a long time, but only recently has come to life. So Roy, the floor is yours. Uh, Roy, we have some problem with sound. Maybe you can check your uh, microphone. Sorry, guys. One minute and we'll resolve this problem. So, I see people, people from different countries, from Nigeria. Oh, please tell us where you're from. Oh, I can. See, I think we can hear right now. Yeah. Does this work? Oh, yeah. Finally, we've got the voice. Perfectly. Then please start again. <laughs> where did you lose me? Somewhere here. So um, yeah, to briefly sum that up again, this talks about um, about React, React Native, and JavaScript, and how you can learn it once and write it everywhere. Um, so basically, I will be telling you about how you can use JavaScript everywhere on all platforms uh, without having to rewrite the logic uh, several times. So a little bit about myself. Uh, so now my name is Roy. You can find me on uh, Twitter with the uh, with the handle GetHackTeam. Uh, and currently, I work for uh, Van der Brun, which is uh, a Dutch company um, that focuses on renewable energy and also supplying renewable energy to um, to people. Uh, previously, I um, I worked for the city of Amsterdam, where I did a lot of open source projects, uh, mainly revolving around uh, JavaScript, TypeScript, React. Uh, not really React Native, but it's something I've been teaching at the React GraphQL Academy, where we um, teach people or more advanced developers how they can use React, GraphQL, React Native, and those kinds of technologies. And previously, I've been involved with uh, with some other companies as well, and also founded several startups. Um, so besides uh, my work as a developer or founder or CTO, um, I've also written several books, uh, mainly about React, but also React Native. So if you're still learning React Native, make sure to, uh, to find those online or find me on YouTube where um, you can find all the previous talks that I did. Um, a lot about React, but also React Native, GraphQL. So that's also a bridge to, um, to my latest book about the full stack GraphQL. I think especially if you're learning new technologies, then GraphQL is something you should focus on. So in this book, you will uh, learn to master GraphQL with, uh, with React, uh, Node.js, and also TypeScript. So it's very hands-on. So if you need um, to find code examples, uh, it could be a good solution for you. 
So about today, so what is React Native? So we're all in the, in the junior track right here. So you've probably uh, learned a bit about React Native online or found uh, the website. Maybe you fiddled around with it a bit. Um, but probably you're not really used to the core principles of React Native yet. So um, I can't really see hands as this is a road conference, but some people might think React Native is a hybrid solution. Uh, or maybe some other people think it's a transpiled language that runs on uh, on the mobile phone or on other devices. Or maybe some people think React Native is native because that's what the native is in uh, in the world for, right? So maybe you can use the chat to answer this question uh, for yourself. Uh, but actually, React Native is none of those. So it isn't uh, a hybrid framework or whatsoever. It's not transpiled. It's also not uh, not completely native. So what it actually is, is it's a bundled language. So actually you bundle React Native, um, so you can run it on uh, on native devices, and it interacts with native APIs. So something that's, uh, if you might be switching to the to the senior track later on, uh, React Native use bridges to connect with the native APIs from uh, um, operating system that's running on the device. So if you're running iPhone, it's uh, connecting with the uh, with iOS for uh, Android, it's connecting with uh, the version of Android you're running, and it basically interacts with these native APIs, and therefore make it possible to use things like the camera or your Bluetooth or um, uh, or the Wi-Fi or any other things of uh, APIs that are present on your on your mobile phone. And it looks a bit like this. So before recently, actually, you create React, you write React, and then it's get bundled by React Native, and then it will run on devices for iOS and Android. But since recently, it's also possible to run it directly on the web. This was possible long before ago, but it's now becoming uh, uh, becoming more present. So with React Native Web uh, and Expo, which we'll see later, you actually be able to also run uh, applications that you create directly in a browser. So you can actually create one application that you use on a mobile phone in a browser, that you can use on a mobile phone directly. Um, and also, which you can actually uh, use in the um, in your desktop with with Windows. But today, I'll be focusing mostly on the iOS, Android, and web part because the uh, the Windows part is uh, is something that uh, takes some extra work and is also is introduced the introduced quite recently. So it's also a bit more beta. So what does React do? React creates declarative views that react to changes in data, and this data can be uh, mostly props and states. And these props and states, they will be derived from probably API calls or maybe local files of databases, uh, uh, database are added. And these props and states, you can watch for changes using life cycles. And then changes will be seen in the UI components for your React or React Native application. So if you're already familiar with React, uh, this probably isn't that new for you. If you're new to React or React Native, then it's always good to catch up on this knowledge and really see how it works. So for direct React and React Native, it's mostly UI components, prop states, and changes are seen by life cycles. And it looks a bit like this. So you would have a component uh, that maybe consists of multiple components and data. There's always a one-way data flow in React. So for React Native, it's exactly the same. There's a one-way data flow. So state gets created in top components and then it's passed down to child components, and these are all in the same view. And then in your data or your props, you also pass down uh, functions or events uh, to update the state. So if you have state in component at the top and the child components want to change something, you would just use uh, a function that you pass down and then state will update and everything will re-render. So this is a bit how um, React worked and its structures uh, under the hood. And this example, so we have React running with React Native and you can use it on iOS, Windows, Android, but also also the web. So this is truly learn once, right anywhere. And before, actually, they've been claiming this as well, but it wasn't really anywhere. It was learn once, uh, right on a lot of specific locations, uh, but not basically everywhere. So now with the addition of web and Windows, it's it's becoming more and more anywhere. And still, new platforms are being added uh, added to the uh, to applications. So it's still something that should be evolving over time. But I'm pretty uh, pretty confident that uh, that's what will happen. Uh, but how can you actually run React Native? So uh, React Native is using bundlers. 
uh, the same as you, uh, you use on the web. So probably with React on the web application, you're using, uh, you're using Webpack maybe uh, to run your, your application. For React Native, there are multiple options. So um, by default, React Native will use Metro. Uh, but something that's really popular right now is Expo, which uh, it's another layer of confidence. And they can also bundle your code. And then quite recently, actually, um, there's something new in React Native, or it's not really new. You have a, a, bit, a bundler called Hermes that you can already use in Android, and it's way faster and way more um, uh, way more low key. And recently, there was a, a pull request opened by one of the core contributors to also make Hermes uh, possible to be used on iOS. So this actually will make your bundle on iOS way smaller because that's one of the concerns people usually have, so that React Native bundles get quite big uh, because of all the bridges and the, the bundled codes. Uh, but with Hermes, it's getting way way smaller. So it's a good thing to see that they actually been uh, building upon Hermes to make it also uh, work on um, on iOS instead of just Android. So how to run React Native? Uh, for this, my go-to tool, and especially if you're in a junior track and you don't uh, probably build like entire production-grade APIs, then Expo is the go-to tool. And basically, it helps you build a project and run it natively on all your users' devices. So those devices can be mobile devices, uh, either iOS or Android. Uh, they can be mobile devices that use a web browser. Uh, so you can use it uh, directly from the web browser. And it can also be desktops, of course. So with Expo, you have one bundler that helps you build one project and run it on every device. So Expo can be seen as a toolkit uh, that enables you to use uh, a lot of different things. And how you can actually use Expo. So if you use the React, React Native app, uh, library, or more like the CLI, to create a new application, you automatically get Expo in there. And to actually be able to see what uh, an Expo um, app looks like, you can download Expo Client for iOS and Android, uh, or just use something a tool that I will show you later. And by using this one, I think it's important if you download it now, you can actually watch along when I show you some, uh, some code examples. Um, so let's give you some time to do that. But with Expo Client, uh, you can run um, any Expo application directly on your phone without having to install any application. So it's a huge, uh, huge advantage. And then throughout this presentation, I will have some QR codes for you to scan. Uh, you can scan them with the uh, with your iPhone, uh, or if you have Android, you need to open the Expo Client app, and you can just scan the Expo Client. Uh, you can just scan the QR code using the Expo Client app, and then the application will open on your device which is also quite cool. And then finally, you can just open the application on any platform. So let's leave Windows out of scope for now, but a browser would also work. Uh, and of course, iOS and Android through the usage of the Expo client that you uh, by now may have installed on your, uh, on your mobile phone. And so this is what an example of, um, of an application in React Native looks like. So, we're importing, um, let me show it just right here. So this is the example we have. Um, so in here we have Geekle example one. You can see we have a web application running and it's just displaying this code, right? So hey there, this is Roy Dirks on Geekle. So this is how it looks like on a web. But then we can also run it on Android, of course. You can tap to play. So this is an Android opening with, uh, with the Expo client. You can see it's it's loading, and there you can see the same uh, the same text, right? So this is the same text. Hi there, this is Roy on Google. You can see the same for here, and we could do the same for iOS, and also run it on your own device. So if you have the Expo Client app, you can download it and you scan the QR code, and you can actually directly watch this application on your own device. So we can change this, of course. So maybe hi, this is Roy on Google. You yeah. cross platform summit. Like this, and maybe we can uh, change the background color blue. Make color here white. Oh, I to put some. See, it's cool, right? And then, um, so this is my web view. I can go to Android, I can tap to play. Might need to reload a bit here. Let me. Go to iOS then. You 
look again and we see here the change, right? So now we have iOS, Android. We already saw Android. There's a bit of a queue here because um, the thing is thus, you have to wait sometimes because other people are also um, using Expo Snack. So the thing we're seeing here, we're just using React, right? Uh, using React native components. So you're just using React, uh, but then you need to import components from React native. Um, for example, the view. So this can be, um, so this is basically on a web browser, you wouldn't have a view, but you would have a div. Uh, text could be like a span. Um, and then the style sheet gets created something like this. You can also use inline styling. Uh, but this is to give you an idea, like the difference between React and React Native. But most of all, it's just the same. You're importing React. So you can use um, state from React in here as well. So maybe we can have something like this. So const state set state is React dot use state and this would be blah blah, blah. something. So this is just React. You can just use React in here, React, use state hook, and then of course you can do all sorts of things that you want to do. And then the, the, the biggest changes are having the exact like components, like the view, the text, and then the component to create the style. And in here you can just uh, put your styling, uh, this is all camel case, and then put things in here, a padding top, this is like a constant, so Expo also gives you a set of constants that you can use uh, to do cool things within your application. So this is like the uh, the minor default application we can create uh, with Expo React Native, and then of course have it run on all devices. So that's cool, right? Because now we have created one application, it's used on several devices, and to your users, they can either go to the web browser or they can just install it on Android or iOS. So let's have a look at some more examples. So HTML element, right? We just saw we have few and text elements, uh, but they aren't HTML elements. So I can imagine if you're working uh, mostly for a web and then you also want some application to be there on the native phone, you will also need HTML elements. And HTML elements look differently on the web than they do on uh, a native application, right? So at the top, we can see uh, our text component has an on-press thing, which is basically like an on-click, but then for a mobile phone. And then we're using some sort of linking method to open a certain URL. So this looks uh, like a lot, because if we look at the web, it's just an H, uh, an H element. Uh, with href and then a link and then um, yeah it's it looks very simpler right but for the um, this wouldn't run on um, this wouldn't run on your mobile phone because there you need to import the react native component so this requires you to write a lot of imperative code so if you're in a junior track it might be interesting to also discuss the difference between imperative and declarative code so usually what we see here this is react and react native or html this is all declarative code so under the hood, a lot of things happen, but you don't see it, right? You just see a text component with on press, and you see uh, an H element uh, with an href. So under the hood, a lot of things is going on, but for you as a developer, you just see text and H. Um, so this is what we call declarative code. But if you want to uh, make this example work um, on both web browsers and on native devices, it will require you to write imperative code, which actually is a step-by-step -step or definitions. There will be more things in there. It's really imperative. So it isn't uh, declarative by default. So you need to do something like this, right? So again, this looks a bit more uh, advanced. So we have a text component again, because React Native will also run on web applications with Expo. So we can just use the text and it will be converted uh, to a span or to a H uh, element uh, by Expo. When you run it on the server devices, you can see there's styling link to it. There's a link, href, geekle.us. It's the uh, the link for the conference. Uh, you can see a target and you can see the on-press. And in the on-press, you can see something happening because in here, we're actually using an Expo constant called platform to decide whether or not we're running it on web. And if we're running it on web, we will link something to the on-press event. So this is imperative code because it isn't that declarative anymore. We're making exceptions. Um, so this is important, um, important to understand how this works. Uh, but this is also something that makes it harder for you to write applications for both the web and native at once because you need to make sure that all these exceptions 
uh, are there in your code. And if they are, things will break, so it will get messy. Um, so there's a solution to this. Um, but first, have a look at the example. You can just scan it again and then see what's uh, see what's going on. Just give you uh, some time to scan this thing and load it, load it in the browser. And then uh, we will have this example, but we actually can see uh, how it comes to life. And then for this, I could just easily do it like this because I'm in the browser either way. So we have the same sort of application, right? Hi there, this is Roy. Um, see again how it works on the several devices. We're launching Android. And then we can see we have the same thing, right? Hi there. Let's maybe um, change the color again. Let's make it green. Oh, like this. And then maybe have the color here set to white, just to make it a bit more re readable for us. And then the link, maybe we also want the link to have a separate color. Maybe we can make the color red. Um, so it's already getting quite Christmassy. So we have some green, we have some red. And you can see the changes are done on both sides. Uh, so in here, we actually, we've created this link that we saw before, right? So hi, this is Roy, uh, and on Google, and this is a link. So let's see if it's really a link. It is, there it goes. So it's the Summit website. So this links work, right? It works on web, but does it also work on your device? So that's something we should check. Let's have it load. So this is Roy, and now to check, bam, it's going to open the uh, the web browser of our mobile phone. So this is quite cool, right? Because now we are using um, this on press function and this text component from React Native to create a link that works on both uh, devices. So for iOS, it will do the same. We have a very long queue there, so let's not do it. Uh, but then again, if you're uh, if you've downloaded the Expo client, um, you can just scan the QR code, and then you should be able to play around with this. So maybe you can change the URL to something else. You can fiddle around with the styling. Uh, maybe add more components here, which you can quite easily do. Um, so this is not that complicated, right? It looks pretty straightforward, um, and this just works on all devices. Or you can use a separate library for this, because of course, um, there are libraries to help you uh, solve certain problems, uh, like having to write this imperative code, because maybe, yeah, maybe you just don't want to write imperative code because it takes uh, more time to um, to test it, to prevent there aren't any bugs. So there's a library actually, actually called Expo HTML Elements uh, that will help you create elements that you can run on both devices uh, automatically based on HTML. So this is something you can find on NPM. And as you can see, it supports iOS, Android, and the web. And so let's see what it looks like. Um, so this is the NPM thing. And then, um, yeah, then basically how it works is, let me see if I've, I don't have the link in it here. So let's just go to NPM Expo. HTML elements and show it to you. So basically what you could do, you can import like a H1 or an A from um, Expo HTML elements and then you can use it just like you would do on the web. So this will make it easier for you to recreate uh, the same sort of logic on both your mobile device and also in the web browser. So they have support for a lot of different things as you can see, they even have support for external things. Um, so that's a cool way for you to um, to get started with this. But now I think we should look at some more advanced features, right? Because uh, of course you're here to learn and these things are all still uh, quite basic. So let's find a more advanced feature like the camera. I think uh, most applications that are built for the phone, uh, at some point you want to use the camera, right? Because that's actually the, the main advantage of having a phone that there's cameras or multiple cameras in there. So cameras always require you to do several things. You need to request permission to use the camera. 
and you actually need to enable the camera and use it uh, on the device. So requesting permission is something that works differently on every device. So iOS has a different way to request permission. Android has one. And in the web, for example, Chrome or Firefox, they also have methods to have you request permission uh, to use the camera, for example. And this is a recording I made uh, this morning, I think. Uh, to actually test it out. So this is the third example I'll be showing you. And in this code, you can see you need to request permission, and then you can use the camera on all devices instantly. So I'll give you some time again to scan this example to see uh, to see what it looks like. And in here, you can see several steps. So at first, of course, requesting permission to use the camera, and then secondly, enable the actual camera. So if we go here, we can find example number three. Again, make sure to scan it uh, with your Xbox client so you can use it on your own device. And in here, we can see again, we're using several things. So we're using state from React. Uh, on the web, you can see it here. Ah, actually, I already enabled the camera, so you can actually see me right here waving at you to see it works. So let me see how it goes. So we're going to start by importing permissions from Expo because we need to request those permissions to actually use the uh, to actually use the camera. And then we're going to import in the camera from a package called Expo Camera. And then in here, we're having state. So we're using state to see whether or not we have the camera permission. So we have a use effect call uh, right here. Clean it up a bit because otherwise it will get messy. It still works, right? Um, so whatever happens, so whenever my application loads, uh, the use effect hook will be called and it will start asking for permission. And it asks for permission using the permissions API from Expo, which you can find right here. So we're asking permission to use the camera, which is quite important because you need to ask permission to use the camera on all devices. And whenever someone said it's granted, um, status will be returned, or you know if you can actually use the camera or not. So let's try this for Android maybe. Tap to play, only a small queue of one. So it will resolve quite, Quite fast, I think. Already see something is launching. So there we go. So now we're opening the uh, the Android device and we're running this code that does several things. Let's first start by requesting our permission to use the camera and then it will open the actual camera. So here you can see, right? So Expo wants to take pictures and record videos. So let's say we want to do that. If we press deny, actually, uh, nothing will happen. Uh, you can see here, if you don't have camera permission, it will just return an empty view without nothing, without no camera. Or if we say it's false, it's going to say we can't access the camera. So for sake, actually, let's try deny. You can't access camera. OK, let's try another device. Let's try iOS. The queue is a bit long. Maybe go back to Android. It already has a long queue. Which one is faster? Ah, this is going well. So let's open up an iOS, see what it looks like over there. So we're already there. We have just a queue position of one. Let's start it load. So again, we're opening uh, the same code on another device. Expo would like to use camera. Yes, we let you use the camera. And then actually we get a blank screen because, uh, well, we can't uh, use the camera from the emulator, of course, because the emulator doesn't have a camera. Um, that's why I always advise you to take your Expo client on your, uh, on your mobile phone, either iOS or Android, scan the QR code, and actually see if, uh, what it will look like. Uh, but for web, you can see it all works perfectly fine, as you can see me waving here. And this is all being done by this camera component. So it's not that much code. I can see it's only like 46 lines. And with this code, we've created a camera that we can use on web, Android, and iOS. That's cool, right? It's not that much code, but still, you get a lot of functionality. And who would know that writing uh, the use of the camera would be that easy? So maybe you can already start creating your own TikTok or Snapchat competitor um, using this uh, this small library in this small code example. So again, here's still the, the URL if you want to scan this and use it on your own device. Um, and there's way more to explore because we've only seen some basics, right? So we saw how you can create a link that works on all devices, how you can create a basic application that runs on all devices. And something else we saw is how to use the camera on all three separate devices. So We've seen some futures, uh, some more complex, some more easy, but still there's always more to explore, right?
And something that's uh, it's a vital part of every, every application that you want to run in there, I think, is using React Navigation. So how you can use Navigation that works on all devices. But this is something that's interesting, right? Because navigation on a mobile application is different than navigation in a web browser. So React Navigation on the web, so React Navigation is by far the most popular uh, library to use navigation for React Native. It also has a way to run on the web. And as you can see, node support for the web is experimental, work in progress, it has bugs, missing features, blah, blah, blah. But still, if you want to create a basic application that works everywhere, um, it, still has, uh, it still is functioning correctly. If you want to go for more advanced things, also want to make sure that your uh, SEO is on track, so Google will still like you, then it will take more time to, uh, to have this work. But for basic applications, it already works. So this is something that's good to um, it's good to know. If you create a simple application that does several things, like making pictures, having a profile, having a detail page, you should be fine with React Navigation on the web. If you're building an e-commerce or a social medium, uh, you maybe need more advanced features. And something else that's cool is progressive web apps, or PWAs in short. Um, so this is a website that you can install as an app on your phone. So with Expo and React Native Web, you can do this again. So you can create um, a PWA, a mobile website, and an iOS and an Android application all at once. And for usage, you can just go to the Expo documentation and see how this works, uh, because a PWA will also work if you don't have an internet connection. So this is another feature that's more advanced, but you can already use it. And then there's something really cool. You can use React Native with Expo with Next.js. So if you're familiar with React, Next.js is a framework for React that makes it super easy and super simple um, to create applications. And Next.js also has navigation built in. So that navigation, you can also uh, use it with Expo uh, and React Native. So this, um, this post on, uh, on the Practical Dev was uh, posted by Evan Bacon, and he is one of the people that works for Expo. So if you would follow him on Twitter or on the Practical Dev, you can find he has many more tutorials and explanations about uh, how to use Expo with React Native and React Native on the web to create applications for all platforms. So um, we definitely check this out because the more you read about it, the more interesting it gets. But still, like I told you, React Native Web, um, you can already do a lot of things with it, but it's still coming there. It's still things to improve. And of course, uh, it isn't perfect yet, but still uh, things are being added to it. So that's good to, uh, it's good to know and good to understand. Um, so thank you again for listening to me. If you want to learn more about uh, the things I've mentioned and showed, make sure to find my Twitter page online. Um, where I've been tweeting a lot about uh, GraphQL, React, React Native, TypeScript things. Or if you still have time during the breaks to watch some more talks, make sure to find me on YouTube. And then if you're interested in GraphQL, make sure to, uh, to get my latest book about uh, building full stack GraphQL applications, all with TypeScript, React, uh, not React Native, but it's something uh, you can probably, as you saw today, uh, it's easy, you can do it, so you should be fine with that. So uh, yeah, thanks for listening and uh, make sure to find me online. If you already have some questions, I think you can just uh, post them in the chat and then uh, we can make sure uh, that we can have some answered for you. Thank you. Hi, uh, thank you, Roy, for your uh, talk. It was, I think, amazing. So I captured a couple of questions. I think we have time to answer them. So uh, you can see one on the... Um, so you cannot do a phone emulator with an AMD chipset. Uh, chip I wouldn't know actually. Um, I usually I use the emulator with Xcode on my uh, on my MacBook, and that works. Uh, but I'm not sure if you mentioning gives you uh, the best idea about how to uh, to interact with it. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And uh, one more, I think, more global and philosophical. <laughs> mm -hmm. So are there any chances this framework won't be used anymore in a couple of years, or is it the opposite? Well, I think it's always uh, always a gamble if you try something. Um, they use React Native for all their apps, and they heavily invested in it. And also React Native is being uh, 
uh, used by Facebook, also in the Instagram application, in their own Facebook application. So there's always a chance, but there's a lot of big companies that heavily invested in it. So uh, yeah, I think it will be safe, safe bet to say that you can use React Native for at least uh, the next five years on production uh, environments. Okay, Roy, thank you for your answers. I think your talk was really enjoyable. Sorry, yeah. Oh, I wasn't saying anything. Oh, okay. So we are like saying thank you for you for now, and we'll be looking to hear you more on the Q&A session. So guys, I hope you like really enjoyed Roy's talk. So Roy, bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. And it's time to present our next speaker, uh, who is Mayang Tiwari, a freelancer, software engineer, and technology enthusiast by nature. Uh, Mayang brings with him over five years of experience in software designs and architectures and expertise in front-end development of web-based softwares with cutting-edge edge technologies. We will hear from Mayang such topic as when and why React Native is a good technical solution. So, um, Mayang, if you are ready, we are welcoming you and I'm giving you the floor. Um, I think you should check your uh, microphone because we can hear you. I hope I'm audible now. Now is perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So thank you, Anna. Thank you for the introduction. I'm just sharing. Um, okay. We'll see in a couple of minutes then. Okay, so I hope uh, I'm audible now. So let's get started. <clears throat> yeah, so uh, today uh, I will be talking about the when and why React Native is a good technical solution, specifically uh, on some circumstances. We do have a couple of options like Flutter, Ionic, and others uh, native uh, technologies as well. So uh, we we will discuss more about onto the when and why uh, we should choose the React Native uh, as a good technical solution onto the enterprise level and whenever we are just doing something from scratch. Okay. So here I am. Uh, as Anna already introduced, I won't take much time onto this particular slide, but still, I'm Mayank Tewari. I'm engineer at EPAM and uh, I'm a full stack Mern developer. Uh, along with that, I'm a hybrid mobile app developer as well. So uh, I will be most most of the time I will be dealing with uh, Ionic and uh, other Flutter stuff and React Native as well. Okay. So here you can find me on LinkedIn, Mayank Rajin T, uh, on Twitter as well, Facebook, Instagram. Okay. So let's move out to the let's move out to the um, <clears throat> agenda part. Here we'll be having a, a when does it make sense to use React Native. Uh, then we'll be moving towards the uh, benefits of React Native for enterprise and if you'll be doing some your own project, uh, then you'll be getting some sort of benefits. Along with that, uh, how better React Native is. Uh, okay, so what sort of promises it will be giving it and what you're gonna achieve it when you start developing it React Native. Okay. And then at last, we'll be discussing why you should consider React Native for your mobile app development. Uh, if you'll be thinking of some, some, some solution, why should you choose it? What are the features you'll be getting it? OK. So let's get started with when using React Native. OK. So we, as a developer, we're all having a lot of questions when we are just thinking about the mobile development, that which technology we should use, which technology, which tech stack like Angular, uh, uh, Flutter, and Ionic or either native Swift, Java, and all those sort of stuff, right? But when it comes to the JavaScript uh, end, we'll be having one, one thing is there, React Native. Because most of the time, front-end developers are thinking, like, if I already have a JavaScript expertise, why should I uh, uh, not jump onto the React Native and build it something uh, which is very familiar already onto the market and 
open source community, right? So this is the very first question we are getting it, and we will be answering those in next slides. So let's move ahead then. Okay, so in this particular side, we'll be uh, figuring out some couple of points that uh, which particular point of time we should discuss this one, right? So yeah, these are the points. I hope you are able to see now. Uh, so with the, with, with the very first point that we are discussing over here is when you want to cut the development time specifically, because uh, whenever we are just doing the native development, I can say we need to track a lot of things in terms of development, in terms of, in terms of architecture mm -hmm. thing, in terms of other, other components, which is already given by the native operating system, right? But when it comes to the React Native, the very first point is very handy to us, right? So when we just wanted to cut the development time because we already have a very good user and code base in the open source community and internet, you can get something out of it and you can use it, right? It will be very easy to understand as well because the code is written in completely JavaScript and XML combination. That is nothing but JSX. And most of the web developers nowadays, senior or intermediate or beginner, I can say, they are at least able to understand the JavaScript code initially, right? So that's why when you get started with the React Native, this particular point, you'll be get benefit with, with this one. And then you can think of, yeah, at that particular point of situation, I should use the React Native, okay? So this is the very first point that uh, you can go through. The second point would be, when you don't want to double your uh, dev team or just increase the, uh, uh, count for the developer point of uh, point of aspects, right? <coughs> I'm sorry. So uh, this particular point is there when we just wanted to uh, think about the developer perspective as well, the count and number of people who will be involving specifically onto the development uh, phase of the application. Okay. So as we are most of the time dealing with the front end development when we are just uh, developing something for the browser based application, right? So we already have a front-end developers who have some sort of uh, front-end knowledge, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, I can say, and those already well-versed with these sort of tech stacks. So it will be very easy to help them to understand that, that what React Native it is and what are the benefits we'll be getting from that particular uh, framework, what we're going to achieve it, and how we can write a code with a very minimal line of uh, things, and we can achieve the very robust functionality out of it. Okay, so you can use the same front end team and just train them in such a way that they can use the React Native in very uh, <clears throat> good way. Okay, so the very next thing would be uh, when you don't have any animation. Yeah, it is correct because React Native is ultimately a hybrid application, right? So yeah, it will give you the feel of the native application, but still it is a hybrid one. So it will not support that much of animation, which usually native applications are giving it up, okay? So when you are planning to have a uh, application with React Native with minimal uh, animations and transitions and this sort, this sort of thing, then you can probably offer the React Native, okay? And when you just wanted to have a sort of a game application where a lot of uh, things are going on to the background, graphics is rendering and GPU processing is needed, probably you should try for some other frameworks as well, okay? So there you can get a lot of things. You can you can yeah, immediately interact with the native APIs, which is given by the operating system of mobile devices, and you can you can perform in much better way. All right. So next, to move ahead for the fourth point that we are having. Uh, other thing is when you need to bring more efficiency to the app development. Efficiency is means what, right? A performance, a scalability, a feasibility, right? These are the aspects whenever we are just thinking about the more uh, efficiency and app development, we are just thinking those sort of terminologies. But yeah, it is right. When we are just thinking about the JavaScript code, it is already uh, established and we have very good user, uh, code base across the internet. We can use the very uh, good best practices and examples and we can give the more efficient way by planning the architecture. So in this particular point, we should think about the architecture first. How you are how you are defining your application source code? Okay, what are the modules it is getting communicated? It's not that much messy. That multiple bridges that you have created, and then you are jumping and on and off to get something out of it. Okay, so it should be very straightforward. You just request it for something, and it should be get uh, 
uh, a sort of a response in a in a fraction of seconds i can say so this particular thing you can get it in react native okay because as it is very uh, efficiently written in terms of natively and it will uh, it will be taking inspiration from xml as well so it is it is much fast and uh, robust in uh, when you deploy your application onto this native mobile operating system i can say ios or android or web i can say okay so the very fifth point uh, that we are having here is when you want to achieve remarkable uh, third party app compatibility so what it is actually means react native is giving a lot of external compatibilities as well you just can plug and play it will not restrict you that something is written in a specific way no you do have a couple of code which is already there and you can just bring it up just learn from them and what it will be usable for that particular app you need it just go for it okay it won't restrict you and it won't take much time to integrate those one so that's why it's very handy to bring any of the third party feature and integrate onto your system like like um, integration of the camera or uh, user touch base or animations bit of animations i can say not not heavy animations and uh, uh, user experience material design those sort of third party uh, compatibilities are there right that you can easily use it in your react native okay so now we are having we are will be moving towards the benefits okay so whenever you will be discussing about the react native or anyone asked you that why should i use the react native what are the benefits behind it there are already uh, other frameworks and libraries into the market why should i choose react native over those so this is the very first question we will be getting it and it will be very uh, sometimes be, before getting onto the project it will be very uh, hard to explain those scenarios right so you can just go through it onto the internet and there are a lot of stuff already there but we will explain some of them which is very useful for you to explain someone that why i am using the react native for mobile mobile application okay so let's get those we do have uh, benefits of react native here and the very first point that we are having in a benefits is possible <clears throat> to use native code what is the mean of what is the meaning of native code right so as i already explained that react native is roam around the javascript framework what is the mean of a rate native one so uh, it is very handy for some of the developers who don't have a specific javascript app development experience or html css knowledge right so if they do have a java or swift or uh, other c objective c uh, knowledge onto their app development they can easily use it through the react native yeah it is possible to use the native code in your project yeah that's why this is the very first benefit that i have just pointed it out the very next would be web inspired layout techniques so what do you mean by web inspired usually in in, in the couple of years back when we are just seeing the mobile apps it was not the same experience that we are getting onto the browser right because where your browser is very handy and it will only understand three languages what are those html css and javascript html will just render it a uh, sort of a structure css will give you the most stylings and javascript will help us to uh, i mean to say help user to interact to the web application in very very efficient way so that's why we inspired it with this one web one and we took that inspiration into the react native as well okay so the very handy animations the very smooth transitions when app is moving from one window to another window if you'll be moving out to the another application it is also behaving some sort of loaders and and a uh, very engaging experience you'll be getting in this one in react native okay so the, the that's why i mentioned it over here the whole sort of web development experience you'll be getting in react native as well when you start developing out okay so the very next would be code reusability across the application right so when someone approach us to start uh, developing onto the mobile app okay the very first thought we will be getting it okay i do have a couple of operating systems and i need to target those for for android i just need to pick one language i need to design the code i need to architect that code and then i need to deploy code there are some sort of process that i need that i need to repeat it again and again for every operating system right so that's why react native comes in the picture and it will gives us a very good feature over here is that we can use the code again and again for the different operating systems as well android apple and other web web as well okay so you can use lot of uh, i can say 80 to 90% code you can use it from one operating system to another operating system you no need to write it again from the scratch 
or no need to bother about. If you return some of the test cases, you you done a lot of testing onto your development end, then you no need to bother about the uh, same particular code will be running onto other system or not. Okay, you no need to bother at all because the same code that we are running over the uh, one operating system that will be same uh, logic building we can apply to the other operating systems as well. Okay, so the very next would be uh, React Native. Okay. React Native performs as same as native apps. Okay, so here uh, the field that you are getting it right in the previous uh, uh, couple of years, we will be having a web apps. Web apps is nothing but a, just a clone of your website which is running onto your browser, but it is using the inbuilt browsers. Okay, inbuilt browsers they are using, but still they are just using the same tech stack, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and other stuff. Okay. But nowadays, as we do have React Native, progressive web apps, they are just a bit different. They are also using the same concept, but they are a bit different. Okay, they are giving the more user feel and that we are getting specifically for the native apps. Okay, so how you'll be getting a native app experience that I've already explained using some some couple of text tags that we are using in React and some other libraries uh, that that you can use it. Okay, so. Here I have explained it that every application that you have created within React Native would be able to perform like same native app easily. Same experience you'll get it over there. Okay. So the very next would be um, how better React Native is. Okay. So now we have gone through the benefits. Now we understood, okay, if any point of time I'll get some app development or uh, mobile app development, I can think of some of the benefits from React Native. I, I, can, I can match with my requirements and then move ahead based on that right so this one uh, usually how better react native is whenever react native renders native applications for both ios and android mobiles react uh, takes charges of the view controller okay so view controller and programming generates the native view using the javascript this is how it would be running okay and that's why this is better when it comes to the react native okay so let's just move ahead with some of the points that we can think of that why it makes much better in comparison to other frameworks and libraries. Hmm. So here I mentioned there are other stuffs as well, but here I mentioned some of those. Yeah, it is based on the JavaScript, so it's purely written on JavaScript, nothing more than that. Yeah, it's a combination of other stuff as well. The primary thing that you need to learn onto the JavaScript is one. And there is no such sort of restriction that you need to react, uh, that you need to learn React before getting started with a React Native. No, it is not like that. You just need to have some basic understanding of JavaScript, ES6 and ES6 plus standards, and then you can move ahead with that. There is no such sort of limitation that, first of all, I just need to learn, understand, and uh, architect the basics of uh, uh, React, and then only I can move ahead with that. No, if you do have a good JavaScript uh, knowledge, then you can surely move ahead with that, because it will be very easy to uh, grab the knowledge onto React Native just with the help of JavaScript, right? And then we'll be having uh, here is native controls and modules. What are the native? We have talked about a lot of the native modules is there, right? So what it is exactly about? It contains a lot of native stuffs and controls which we are using and which we need to use it whenever we just need to uh, start with the mobile app development. What are those? They are just uh, um, Bluetooth op op options, wireless performing, and uh, GPS controlling, uh, controlling, and those are things that you can use it as a native control and module. Okay, so here I have mentioned it uh, that React Native uses native APIs. Okay, to render primitive native APIs, who will be giving it? Operating system is giving up the native APIs which you can use it in your React Native code. Like iOS, if I'll take example of iOS operating system, operating system will gives you the camera API, Bluetooth API, wireless API, GPS API, and those sort of things, then you can very easy to integrate in your React Native. And those are just behave like a native controls. Like you just plug and play and it will be using and it will be behaving and uh, it will be giving the same user feel to the user as it will be there into the native web apps. Okay. So the next, the very next, I just kept it is you can build a stable high performing app. And what it is mean, okay? So as you can see that we are just learn about a lot of data bindings and Angular and some other frameworks which is already running onto the market uh, in terms of single page application, right? So see, the React Native uh, app development is written in such a way that it's very healthy data binding. 
the way that data are flowing across the component and logics it's very easy to grab them okay in terms of developer and it's very uh, handy to show the user in a very uh, meaningful way okay so this can't affect the uh, overall performance of the entire application if you will be dealing with a high uh, output i can say if you will be uh, dealing with a uh, mbs of data with uh, with the response that you are getting it from the external apis you can easily add it you can scale those apps as well and build a stable uh, output out of it okay so that i have mentioned it right uh, you can result the uh, stable up, uh, updates and you can push it to your app and it will update it very seamlessly okay that is what we are getting it over here right so i'm seeing it a uh, couple of questions over here but no problem i do have a uh, queue around as well uh, dedicated after this slide um, and then we're gonna discuss more on to those one as well so let's get started with the next one as well okay yeah so why react native is there uh, now we understood this one is uh, now we understood this benefits and after getting the benefit what we have understood we have understood uh, how it is working what are the things that we are just going through with the help of react native okay along with that what else we got it some couple of knowledge that we are uh, it will be very handy to us in terms of developing from scratch or creating our own set of solutions. But now, uh, if someone gonna ask us, if someone gonna ask us, okay, now you have told me the benefits, now you have told me that how React Native is better for me, what promises it is giving it, okay? So now, you, uh, someone asks you that why React Native you are using over the Flutter or other uh, hybrid app development frameworks, okay? So you'll be having some couple of answers for this one, but I'll sure, I'll, <clears throat> I surely show you uh, some points over here that you can explain them. Is this is truly native? Truly native is uh, it will give you the same experience that you're having in a native experience, right? It's fast. JavaScript won't lag like that. You are getting a complete code break onto your uh, onto your native web apps. No, it is not that. It will be very easy to handle the stack trace. If any so, if any point of time your application broke off, you'll be easy to get this particular thing from your logs file stack trace and then investigate based on that okay react native are more cap capable of uh, an app <clears throat> capable of run running your app onto 16 frame per second right so it will be very seamless experience for user as well when you are operating the react native apps the react native apps okay so as you have seen that we will be having Bix and uh, netflix and all those sort of stuff we'll be having these experience and you probably understood it well okay so the very next point we are having is vibrant ecosystem uh, ecosystem is what okay so when we are just pushing our developers to the react native solution they should feel that they are having the same experience that they are getting onto the web application part because we just inspired from those one as well right javascript html css and that's what nothing more than that okay so this particular ecosystem is now much more robust in comparison to the regular web development environment okay it will give you the couple of options it will give you the couple of plug and plays and very handy code frameworks which is already written you just need to use it and just run with your application you just need to plug and play it will be uh, already test test cases are written for this one that you can use it and then you can run across the browsers uh, and in your operating systems android and ios right so you can move ahead with that and these are the things that uh, i'm just preferring it whenever i'm just getting started with any sort of mobile app development either hybrid or native web app development so if you'll be getting started with your react native project you should think of some of the points that are particularly discussed with you okay so now i will be moving to the next slide i know i'm uh, a little bit quick but yeah, I just want, don't want to make it more complicated. I just want to make it very simple so that any layman can also understand the features and then whatever the points that we have discussed uh, around the React Native environment. Okay, so yeah, uh, between ease of development, right, quality of the apps uh, built with it, and the richness of the platform and ecosystem, I have a lot of fun learning with uh, 
uh, React Native building with uh, some complex stuff, I can say. And that's what I'm just referring some of the references that you can go through over here. You can go through them, and then you can uh, get a lot of content out of it. Right? So yeah, this is what uh, about my stuff and talk. Uh, any questions, anything, I do have a couple of time now, I guess. So you can freely go through that, and uh, let's tackle those. Hi, Mayank. Uh, thank you for your talk. Yes, we have, I think, uh, quite a lot of time for some questions. So I'm showing you first of it. Sure. OK, so I'll read that question first so that uh, they can also understand this one. What would be the best approach for an Ionic developer to learn React Native? Yeah, it is a very good point and the very good question that you have raised, Sudhir that uh, if you already have an experience of ionic development it is very handy to you because in ionic also we are either using react or angular right and both are having a uh, room around the javascript uh, things so if you'll be going through the ionic thing the same experience of the very well, i can say one step ahead you can get into the react native so it's very good with that uh, then you can proceed with the react native and just uh, Feel free to explore onto this one and you'll get a good experience. But some of the technical challenges that you're going to face it about the deployment, about the debugging, and all sort of stuff, that probably there are a lot of user contribution and open source communities are helping them out. So you can go through those ones. So you can surely go ahead with that. OK, perfect. Thank you. And uh, one more question. Mm -hmm. uh, to any backend, uh, yeah, uh, it is Kabir that you asked a sort of a uh, broader question, but I just um, briefly answered this one. So, what is the question all about? Is can we integrate our React front end to any backend? Yeah, some some couple of integrations that we need to do, and we need to think out the application performance as well. So, suppose you are just running out the backend, which is which is not good in terms of architecture, and you just wanted to perform the operation. In terms of React frontend, anyhow, those are loosely coupled, but still, you just need to check the capability, integration part, and feasibility. Whether you, tomorrow you can scale that particular set of combination of React frontend and that particular backend or not, right? So we can do that. There are a couple of integration techniques that you can follow, like React and Node that you can say, React and .NET, and other backend stuff as well. Then you can surely need to integrate those particular thing and you need to tweak your code specifically for that particular backend. But you can do it. Thank you for your for your answer. I think um, that it was enough for our guest. Oh. And uh, yeah, one more like yeah. Okay, so are things like use context and use are used most in our application? I really struggle to Yeah, see. Uh, before getting on to this particular thing, right, a reducer and context, you need to understand the how the architecture is running for the React, React Native. Yeah, it is uh, not easy to understand, but there are having some couple of best practices that we need to follow. Okay, so I know you are struggling it because initial the initial days I also struggled with those particular terminologies. But when you are just architecting your solution in very much robust way, first of all, focus your application that how it is. It is aligned. Aligned means how you have defined it, how your components are getting communicated, how your files are getting communicated, first of all, how they are aligned into the folder structure, right? And then in terms of terminologies like use reducer and uh, use context, you can easily use this, right? So how the data will be flowing across this one, what are the hooks that you need to trigger with those, and then you can tackle some of the state management as well, this one. But we are using it, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, just one moment. <laughs> for this one, yeah, we are using it, but only for this specific requirement. Not most of the time, because when we get some specific sort of requirement to use the state management or context stuff, then we are using this for sure. OK, perfect. And one more question from Nello. He's from mm -hmm. Italy. I'm mm -hmm. showing you his question. OK, OK. So Nalo is having a question like, uh, what is the best practice in order to around 80% of share code? Is this some even when we want to share code between mobile app and website? Yeah. 
So Nalo, the very first practice that we are having is uh, that uh, how you'll be defining your code, whether it's a modular way or you have defined under the functional way as well, right? So you should be your code should be very much modular. You should not return more than twenty lines in a specific function. You should not have a nested ifs. I can one or three one or one level or three level, or it should be uh, aligned with the particular standards of the operating system as well. It's not like that just you're blindly writing the code and you're just thinking that, no, it's going to work on to Android and iOS. There are some tweaks are there that we need to take care. But yeah, most of the code that uh, we are writing or logic we are writing on React Native, is it's usable most of the time. We should not return much out to it. But when we are just dealing with the native APIs, I can say uh, Angular, oh, sorry, uh, Android or iOS and other operating systems, we need to have some sort of specific code or we need to inject something to get that work seamlessly onto that particular operating system. Along with that, you have asked, you can uh, uh, wanted to share the uh, code base for the website as well. Yeah, you can use it. You can run the same application on the web as well, but for that one again, you need to sub some, you need to set some of the environment practices and how it will be behaving onto the web app that you also need to justify in terms of code, I can say, okay? So yeah, you can use it. You can go ahead with that. You can uh, deploy your application onto the Android, iOS, web freely. Okay, thank you. I hope Nello will be like fully satisfied with your answer. Uh, we have like more time for questions and here yeah. is like one more. Mm -hmm. Okay, so one more question from Kabir. Uh, how long on the average will it take you to master React from scratch if you are willing to learn on a regular basis? Suppose you have basics of HTML. Yeah, this is a very good question for the beginners, right? So suppose, Kabir, you are starting it from the HTML, CSS, and JavaScript is 100% mandatory. JavaScript is 100% mandatory. And uh, because of that one only, we just came across the React Native. JavaScript is good. HTML, CSS, it's good to have, and I can say nice to have, but JavaScript knowledge is mandatory. You should have the knowledge of the latest standards, best practices, like how you'll be using the scope, hosting, and ES6 standards, that uh, class component, object components, how the uh, hooks are getting communicated. Then you can start with the basics of JavaScript ES6 standard first, and then you can move ahead with directly to React Native. You no need to uh, deviate you from some other stuff like React or some other uh, JavaScript framework. You just learn HTML, CSS, JavaScript, ES6 standard and jump onto this one. Usually, it, uh, I, I should not say the specific time, but uh, as, as you said it, I'm just learning onto the regular basis. Yeah, you can go ahead with that and you can achieve in a master, I can say, four to five months. But the very first thing is just type a code, okay? It's not about the learning the blogs or uh, just going through the articles and then you are ready for the masters onto the React Native. No, it's not like that. Just keep handy with the code base, which is available onto the React Native forum. Just get the knowledge, debug it, try to Google the things that you're getting into the stack trace, what is the meaning of this one, and then you'll be getting uh, uh, understanding in detail and in depth, I can say. Thank you. I think that's like really good suggestions you made. And uh, one more question mm -hmm. we have, and here it is. Okay. So Basha, you'll be having a question is, can we use React Native to build an AR app? Uh, if yes, it is possible for any other JS libraries as well. It is. Frankly, I just uh, did one type of POC for React actually, not React, I can say. Uh, yeah, it is possible. There are already a couple of code base you can find it out on GitHub and it is having a very good user reach as well. User reach in terms of uh, developers and there are a lot of code snippet you can find it out. But it's very good solution that you wanted to go ahead uh, a sort of an AR app using React Native. So, yeah, you can. But as I said it right in the one of the slide, animations and some sort of other things, uh, you won't get the exact experience that you are getting into the native app, right? So probably you need to check the performance, how many operations that you are just doing onto your AR app, how frequently you are giving, giving the user feel, that also you need to think of, okay? So the transition, animation, and your frame per seconds, and processing of the AR images or the environment settings, these are the things that you need to take care of, but you can do ahead with that. I don't have any other a suggestion for the other JavaScript uh, libraries, but surely you can reach me out and I can uh, give you some sort of good suggestions on that. 
Okay, and I think uh, the last uh, question for uh, for now is mm -hmm. is here. Okay, hey, yes. Uh, nobody perfect. I would suggest to use Udemy instead of books. Oh. <laughs> Practical is uh, important. Yeah, exactly. This is no. a very important point. Yeah. I got that is a point, and there was no question. <laughs> here it is. <laughs> <laughs> Any long books, extra extra suggestion for the best practices of developer? Yeah, there are some good things that you can go ahead. The very thing, uh, the very first thing that you need to get started is create your GitHub account. Okay, start pushing it the very basic component. Basic component, just type a hello world. Okay. And then try to integrate with the most up animations, transitions, uh, tabs. I can say, okay, button clicks. You get fetching the data from the from the uh, third party API, and then you can go ahead. There is no specific book. I just following it. I'm just reading the articles, blog, and the reference that I've shown into my slide. You can go through that one, but feel free to roam around the internet. There are a lot of stuff, and then you can you need to explore it. Okay, don't restrict yourself to any book or article. Just if you are be understanding one point, I can say, just suppose you are understanding the Red X, right? You, sh you should not restrict any book or something. Start practicing it. You'll getting the errors. Start Googling those errors and then get something out of it. And then you'll be understanding easily that uh, that how it will be working, what are the things I need to take care from the next time and other stuff. Thank you. Uh... I guess it was the last question, but Mayank, you are so popular that there are like a lot of questions in chat. And this, as we have like a couple of minutes before our next speaker, I'll show mm -hmm. one more. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Zed, uh, you have a question is why React Native does not include many basic plugins like routing or file manager or Blu-ray? Yeah, it is a good question. See, usually file uploader is behaving in different terms as well, right? So if you'll be dealing in React Native, uh, I can say if you'll be dealing in Android and uh, iOS operating system, they are having a different set of handling mechanism. They have a set of different handling mechanic mechanisms that they are following inside their operating system. Okay, so that's why they are not offering basically. Uh, there are some other couple of things also that they have defined it in their uh, special feature release. When I just and when I was going through the React Native release, they clearly mentioned that. The processing of the data, the blob file, and the, the byte array is not every time handy with every specific operating system. That's why we need to make it very, very common scenario for both of the application that the data that we are processing into the native environment of the operating system, uh, we need to take care and we need to return such with that, that uh, it should be properly communicated to the backend services. That's why they are they are not giving it because React Native is very easy to plug and play, right? You can plug any of the backend services and it you just push the data to the backend services and it will be processing. That's why you need to write it. And that's why they are not giving this particularly thing onto the native environment. Thank you for your answers. I think your like topic is really relevant for all our attendees because mm -hmm. I see a lot of questions and mm -hmm. I hope we'll leave them for Q&A session, uh, which is will be like in an hour uh, or, or less. Uh, so Mayank, like we are really thankful for your time, for your interest to our conference. And of course, we are thankful for your talk, which was amazing. And uh, as one more time, I'll mention that from the reaction in chat, it's really cool. So for now, we are like thanking, thanking you and saying goodbye, and uh, we'll see you very soon for the Q and A session. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Anna. Thank you so much. Thank you. See you. Thank you. So, guys, now it's time to present our last but not least speaker before the Q and A session. So please uh, meet Edwin Klesman. Uh, born in 1981, Edwin has been developing over 17 years professionally, over seven of which he has been developing cross-platform mobile apps. Edwin has been a developer, test coordinator, tech lead at a startup focusing on people and health. And now he's a team lead and the owner of EK Online. He is focusing on creating value through apps. So his topic today is value first, app second. So Edwin, I'm adding you to like to our <laughs> stream and please you can begin. Thank you, Anna. Thank you for that introduction. I'm really excited to be uh, amongst all these uh, top developers from all over the world on this event. Uh, I'm glad that you've tuned in to my talk if you're listening. Um, but before we dive in, I just wanted to say my talk 
is called value first, app second. And that's because I think there's a lot more to coding and coders than development alone. Uh, this talk, unlike many others in this uh, seminar, isn't uh, a coding session, but it is about creating value as a developer. So I really think that it adds up to you uh, uh, providing more value for your customers and the users of your products. The times are changing. Uh, as you might know, a lot of tools have been created in these last uh, 10 years or so. And a lot of these tools are low code, no code, uh, which kind of might form a threat to developers because coding isn't as uh, high pay, uh, as, as uh, uh, undoable as before. And a lot of people uh, can use tools like these to create uh, applications and solutions without having to dive into code first. Um, this isn't all bad news though, because amongst a lot of these tools, there are tools that we as developers can use ourselves. As you can see on this image, there are dev, users to, dev user tools on the bo bottom side and business users with, without the tech background on the top side. A combination of these can be used by us also to create value. But before I dive into value creation and uh, the value first mindset, let me talk a, bit, a little bit about me. Well, Anna already explained uh, that I have uh, over 17 years of development experience. Uh, this December, I will have uh, a professional career as a developer for 18 years. Uh, and where I started out as creating uh, web development uh, software applications for a big bank, I uh, fast uh, uh, i sh sure went into uh, mobile development very soon after that uh, as soon as the first iphone landed in the netherlands i uh, created a little app just to get a hang of how to create it and uh, launch it uh, from there on i started to be a developer and later on i consulted as a cross cross-platform app developer and uh, during this path i really noticed that there is a one um, thing that I was focusing on the most. Um, because when you put me in a team, uh, and especially in the early days, I wasn't the best developer amongst that team. There were people who were very fast at coding, who crea created very clean code, but somehow I thrived in those teams. I could really provide value for the customers, uh, for business, and I could really uh, make something that users uh, uh, wanted. Um, so I was thinking uh, during my career, what is it that keeps me afloat on these teams with all these like deep end uh, developer guys and girls, uh, and why can I keep up with them? Um, and I noticed that it's because I have this tendency to talk to the uh, business people. I uh, tend to talk to users. I tend to talk to customers and find out uh, what's behind their initial ask. Uh, that is a very good quality that I think that uh, kept me afloat. And uh, with enough development years under my belt, um, I really started to focusing on creating value. So I want to start with a very bold statement that even though we are developers, I guess my, most of uh, the people watching right now are, coding isn't our main objective. Creating value is. Why? Because when you uh, when you start coding, it's all fine and you need to learn about the coding. But once you get the hang of coding and you start to learn a platform and, and framework, you know that uh, the coding itself isn't the objective anymore. It's what you can do with your code and with your solutions and the value that they, those provide that, uh, that are the real goal. So even during my career, when I was uh, developing, I had a lot of projects going on. I built business to business software, I created uh, business to employee solutions and, and mobile applications. Um, and I also started to learn a lot from reading books, listening to podcasts, talking to people in the tech world. And uh, you just find out that uh, it's all about finding the right people. It's about marketing. It's about uh, 
uh, finding out uh, what is the actual product that is desired and learning how to create those things faster and more convenient for less money. It's all about creating value in generic. And that is one ambition that I have. Uh, and I would, and that is the mindset that I would like to share with you in this presentation. Creating value is what we as a developer uh, should do initially. So here's my statement. Coding is a tool through which we can create solutions that provide value for others. It's not more, it's not less. It's really an important building block. But if, if you keep this uh, in the back of your head, you will uh, can you can see the red line through my uh, presentation. So before we can start about how we can increase value and how you can become a better value creator as a developer, we have to find out what is value. Value, put simply, is what uh, uh, the definition in Oxford uh, in the Oxford is what the Oxford uh, Dictionary says. Um, as a noun, it is uh, the importance and usefulness of something. And as a verb, it is estimating the monetary worth of uh, something that you build. In other words, value is about how important and useful something is to people, and if and how much money they will spend for it. So whenever you build a SaaS solution, a cross-platform mobile solution, or whatever solution, you will have to keep in mind that you need to build something that is useful and something that uh, can uh, gain you revenue. So if you look at it from top down, if a cross-platform solution provides value, users will pay for it, you will have a viable product, and that leads to a sustainable business model which keeps you going on building for the application. But the real deal here is, of course, how can we define what value is? And how can we find out what value is for certain people? Yeah, that is a quest that we will need to go into and that I will happily be, sh be sharing with you in this presentation. In this next slides, I will give you some tools for finding value faster. Um, because a lot of things uh, have been imagined by other people during these last two decades. There have been a lot of um, uh, processes and frameworks uh, uh, put into this, this world uh, where we used to be uh, uh, doing weather file process to uh, think of solutions and building them. A lot of knowledge has been used and put up to create value faster. I'm going to uh, guide you through some of these uh, uh, processes and frameworks so you can see what are the most recent ones. First of all, of course, there is Agile. Agile software development has become the default, almost default, uh, practice to develop your applications. Um, this is because a waterfall project, as you can see in this uh, in this image, uh, tend to be very long and uh, they took for ages. The moment be uh, between defining what you want, uh, uh, putting it in specs, building it and releasing it, and then finding out if that is valuable, yes or no, just uh, takes too much risk. If you, if you look at the red line uh, at the background, you can see that as a lo uh, the longer the process of creating something takes, the more uh, the risk uh, uh, adds up. So that is why agile development was uh, invented. By picking uh, the entire building blocks for your solution, choosing which parts to build first and which ones are the most important, and going through iterations, we were able to develop uh, smaller pieces in a shorter amount of time, thus keeping the risks of building something that is useless by the time it's out there, or uh, by building something that is really off and can be used by the actual users, uh, making it uh, smaller and lower, and thus creating a more safe development process. 
most of you are uh, aware of agile development, so I won't be sticking to this too long. What I would like to add to that is um, you need to create working increments. Every agile increment, every iteration needs to be building something that works. Um, so not like the above, building a wheel, then building a wheel on frames, then building a car, and then building a car with a steering wheel and uh, a top on it. No, each increment should be something that is uh, useful on its own, uh, like the skateboard and the skateboard with the steering wheel, then the bicycle, also motorbike, and, and then the, the car. Uh, every increment is useful, can be used, and can be tested by actual people, because only when you really get uh, use, usage feedback and usage interaction with users of your product, you get valuable information about, is this something that you can really use in your day-to-day -day production environments? Another process that was given life was design thinking. It's a non-linear process, and the main focus on this is um, on uh, empathizing and testing. If you look in, the pro in this process, you can see that empathizing is really talking to people uh, through interviews, through deep discussions, to finding out the finesses of what really uh, they are after and what makes their heart stick faster and testing that as soon as possible. In between are the definition, ideate and prototype phases, which really indicate that you can build interfaces, build designs, build solutions if you want that uh, don't have to work exactly as as they should but by presenting how they would work you can really find out if your solution is going to provide value so empathizing and testing your assumptions basically your assumptions here is what this was all about design thinking is used a lot in the industry still of course by uh, often by designers but i think there is a nice uh, background uh, in this for the de developers as well. Um, in the last decade, um, there was uh, the Lean Startup, something that uh, Eric Ries uh, defined in a book, the, the Lean Startup. And what you do here basically is talking to people is something that is here as well. You can see that the design and testing of solutions is a very important part. Um, you need to find out what is really working as cheap and fast as possible. So instead of thinking about, okay, I got these specs, I know what the customer wants, I know what the users want, I will start developing that in a mobile application. You need to find out how you can put something in front of them as fast and cheap as possible, getting the feedback if this is something that they can really use and go on iterating on that. Another part of the Lean Startup that was very important is building minimum viable products. Let me find the next slide because what really is a minimum viable product? Well. It is minimal, so you only focus on what is minimally uh, going to be used. No real, uh, really uh, big application with all kinds of features that uh, aren't uh, uh, used uh, from the get-go. Um, and if you look at this picture, I think that this really works best uh, what minimum and viable means for um, um, MVP. It's just the minimum functionality that you will define that is useful. Uh, the products that you want to build that are viable because you can gain uh, revenue from them, the overlap between those two is the minimum viable product. Because the if you have a solution and you have focused only on the functionality that is the core functionality, but it is enough core functionality to ask your users or customers money for that, then you will have a solution that is viable and that you can work on and iterate on to perfect. Everything else around the MVP can be all sorts of products, but for the initial phase, they are all waste.
we've seen now a couple of tools and what uh, you can see now is uh, something that Gartner and a couple of other uh, companies put together. Uh, it is the combined uh, process of design thinking, the lean startup and agile development. And although it might seem like this is uh, something that is consistent of a definition period and then uh, 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 implementation period, similar to what waterfall was, I think this process really is different because if you look at it from this angle, you can see that if the, the process is, is in time, something that you go through, you are really going to be circling through this process. And while you are circling, you will have perpetual motion. You will have constant evolve, evolvement of your, of your product and of your idea. And by going through this process, you will be uh, continuously incrementing your solution. So let me see the next slide. If you look at it this way, this process is really just pulling forward in time the, defin the definition of value. So you need to define what the value is for someone. This process uh, prevents you from building something, delivering it, and only then finding out what the value is. By going through this process, you will have an empathize moment that was uh, that was inherited from the design thinking uh, process, where you will actually be talking to people, finding out what they need, what they want, what they are uh, desperate about, and what will really solve their uh, problems. You will define and iterate those uh, assumptions that you make and then go through a test experiment phase. You will try to build something as fast and cheap as possible and, and try to learn from what you've been building by iterations. You can measure if you are on the good path by talking to people, finding out if the usage increases from a test group. And once you have something that is uh, a, a feature set that is the minimum viable product, you can start by adding those into an agile development uh, solution. You start your first iterations with uh, creating your minimum viable product. And once you have defined a minimum viable product that you can launch to a production environment, you can ask uh, people money for that whether it is as a SaaS solution uh, and you want a credit card uh, credentials so you can uh, uh, ask for monthly or yearly fees, or if you uh, uh, provide uh, apps that uh, download uh, from the app stores and that you can provide money with. There are lots of models for uh, gaining revenue, but once you get an MVP out and you uh, get the finesses of what people want and you know that your solution is really desired so the money uh, the value is higher than the money that uh, that you uh, are asking for it or at least equal then people will pay for your solution and you can iterate on so i know this is all a little abstract until this point so i really wanted to give you some value creation examples because when you start developing a solution, a software solution, you can create value in different ways. You can uh, enable people to do something that they weren't able to do before, like uh, uh, enable them to uh, perform a, a process while in transit, in the train or somewhere. Um, you create value when you save people's money and or time, which is essentially also money. You can also uh, literally create value for them when your solution will generate them revenue. But there are also less hard things that can make value for, for people, of mean pe uh, value to people. Making things easier and more understandable could be valuable because more people can uh, pick up your product and uh, uh, perform uh, actions or pro uh, perform any process faster. When you make things more enjoyable, people 
are te uh, tend to use that solution more often. And of course, there is the value in entertaining people because look at uh, social networks like Facebook. Uh, there are moments in uh, people's lives where you just have a small amount of time and you want to be doing something. If you entertain people through games or social networks or whatever, you will be providing value because you will uh, satisfy their need for doing something and to continue uh, through time. To make this even more clear, I wanted to show you an example of how value was created by a solution. We all know um, human health and uh, uh, self, the quantifiable self has really been growing in importance during the last 10 years or so. And uh, uh, the big platforms like from Apple, Google, uh, uh, solutions like Fitbit have all been focusing on this market. Um, they are really enabling people to track their health and condition. So you see that is where they create value for people. Um, for themselves, they were generating value uh, through uh, pro subscriptions that will provide you with more features and more insights and the sales of uh, hardware, of course. Um, and what is really uh, is interesting is that by providing uh, mobile solutions, cross-platform solutions, they made it easier to gain insights on how you are doing, how you are performing, uh, what your heart rate is, uh, if you're uh, becoming more fit. And it's also enjoyable because they keep you motivated through competitions, uh, uh, through wearing cool gadgets that look awesome. And between uh, other users of their platform, you can uh, uh, talk to them, you can inspire each other, which all increase the usage of the, the platform. By competing with other people, it also makes you, uh, uh, gives you something to entertain because you can do a gamification, you can perform gamification uh, games, you can do challenges. And all these things add up to the solution providing value because we as consumer get uh, enabled, we can do things easier, we get insights we didn't have before, and we can do this with with usage of cool gadgets around our, around our wrists and on our uh, mobile apps. These examples aren't really uh, earth shattering, but most of them aren't obvious from the beginning. You need to converse with the actual uh, customer or user to find out what value brings. And if you think, oh, well, there's someone to uh, that is indicating that talking to people is valuable, but why is talking so important? Well, let me give the oven example. I have an oven at home. It has a touch interface, it's really nice. It's, it's, it has alarm bells, all the whistles. But what I really, I'm uh, looking at now is there are so many programs in my oven that is beautiful, but they aren't useful to me. This kind of abundance of features doesn't provide value to me. If you see here, I only use the hot air stuff, the grill roasting sometimes, perhaps even sometimes a defrosting program, but everything else that has been baked in is not valuable to me. So you can see there is not only defining what value is for the user, you also have to dive into the context of the person you are building for to find out which part of a solution is valuable to them. If I, if I were to build this oven for me, I would have a cheaper oven, I would have a simpler oven with just the programs that I need. Um, and I would use that with a lot of pleasure leaving some money in, my, in the back pockets of my jeans. So how can you as a developer find the need and value for people? You use your tech expertise to begin with. I've had my share of clients during my career that knew for sure that they needed a mobile app in the app stores uh, for their company. Uh, but I ended up creating a mobile first website application for them. 
uh, and that is just an indication of how sometimes people ask you something customers can ask you for a specific solution but if you start conversing with them and talking about what they really need talking about the pros and cons of putting a, a mobile app in the app store versus a, a a, uh, an, um, a hybrid application or an, uh, a web application that is uh, that is uh, uh, usable on mobile phones, then they will start to understand that there are more roads that lead to Rome, that they can get a, their solution, but it might have another form. Had I just given my customer the mobile app, uh, sure, they would have gotten what they wanted, but over the end, there would be a lot of discussion about who was going to pay for keeping that application up and running. And uh, it would be more time consuming and more expensive uh, to keep that application uh, actual and up to date for them. I like to label the usage of your knowledge about a platform, um, the technical possibilities and understanding how you build something, the coders angle. So. When you look at it from the cross-platform development angle, we know as a developer uh, which sensors are available on the mobile phone, which things that you can use. You can use QR code scanning with the camera. You can use proximity sensors. You can use the GPS. Those are all things that we got in our minds and that we can use, this expertise we can use, to discuss with people what is possible. Also, there are awesome frameworks, frameworks like React Native and Flutter and whatnot that we can use to create solutions uh, more fast uh, and uh, that help us to create solutions quicker um, and let us think about the plumbing less and focus on value creation more. So all of these are aspects that uh, the coders angle uh, provide and that you can use to create value for your, uh, for your customers or users. By talking uh, with people, you can find out, find out what's beneath their initial ask, what is under there. And there are a couple of things, a couple of ways that I would like to show with you to find out how you can really deepen conversation and find out what is behind a, a, a question that a customer asks you. The first one is the five whys. Some of you might have heard of this. It's really not that difficult. When there is a problem at hand, like someone ran through a red light, you can ask multiple times why to find out what's really beneath it all. So if a customer asks for a product A, you can ask why you want that and keep iterating through that. In this example, when you ran through a red light and you ask why, it's because you were late for work. Why were you late for work? You stood up too late. Why? Because the alarm clock broke. And why? You didn't check if it worked. And why? Because you didn't set or check if it worked uh, the, the earlier, the last night. If this were a software solution, you might have implemented a, a push notification that would uh, tell you this evening to check your alarm and set it for the next day. And that would solve this problem. And that would be a different problem than uh, uh, notifying someone if he or she is going to run through a red light. So asking multiple times, why is this important? Why did this happen? Will help you to find out a root cause and a root problem. Another process that I would like to uh, share with you is, uh, sorry, let, let me first, uh, this, this uh, sheet is uh, important to first um, because the five whys are really important. But if you are asking someone, I have this solution for your problem, will it work? Um, that will often re result in false negatives. Uh, Rob Fitzpatrick wrote a book, The Mom Test. He's a tech guy himself. And he, this book has really given me insights in the right technique and the right questions to ask to find out what's what's uh, working for someone, what will provide value. Because when you ask the wrong questions, like 
um, asking your mom, look, mom, I made this app. Is this really going uh, to be something that you use? You, those people often don't want to hurt you. They want, uh, they see that you've put time and uh, effort in your idea and they don't want you to uh, feel miserable. So they will be saying, oh yeah, sure, sure. But when it's in the app store or when it's released and you want to have money for that, they're like, uh, nah, I'm not gonna spend money on this. This isn't really what I'm after. So if you want a real good resource to find out how to interview people correctly, the mom test is one. Another tool to use is the Golden Circle by Simon Sinek. Um, he really asks, uh, for he really indicates that everything that is being done is dividable in three layers. There is the what, this is something that a company does, for instance, and the product and, uh, or a service that they are selling. The how is how do companies think, uh, what makes it special or different. And the why is really the, purpo the purpose, the, the, the main belief that is beneath it all. The, these are the things that are not money because those are results, not motivators. If I will put this into perspective, uh, something really actual, Nowadays, a lot of countries are building uh, COVID uh, trackers and uh, tracking applications. And if you look from the what, you see that uh, governments uh, are creating these apps because they want to decrease the spreading of COVID-19. And if you look at the how they are doing that, it's through tech, using Bluetooth solutions, mobile applications, uh, and using uh, privacy uh, compliant solutions and providing uh, push notifications and the timely information to uh, indicate to people if they have been around people who have been uh, notified as uh, COVID uh, positive. But when you dive one layer deeper, the why, then you will see that um, as a government, they have an obligation to us to have, uh, to have citizens that are healthy, secure, that that the privacy and stability and income of those uh, citizens is secured. They are just there for the well-being of the citizens. And when you take that mindset into uh, perspective, you will see that um, uh, the importance of privacy and informing people properly is really high. And because that is really high, you can focus on a solution that really secures those uh, important aspects and thus you will be providing more value. I call this the consultant's angle. So when you use these tools uh, like the five whys, talking to people, uh, really finding out what motivates a business or a person to be doing something, you will have uh, you will be putting in both your coding experience and the uh, consultant angle and finding out uh, different ways to reach a goal, present it to your customer or user and find out which one is the best. When you look at the, what I've been discussing for so far is that there is this triangle. You have the coding angle, which we've covered. We've covered the consultant's angle. And you see that once you go up in this uh, triangle, you move from a more, uh, more technical focus to a more value focus. And the more up you go, the broader the viewing angle and the, the different angles that you will be using to solve a problem and provide value will increase. What is value first? Well, value first is uh, about testing value quick and cheap. Even if you have 90% of the baseline of uh, your solution right, uh, the 10% of assumptions that were wrong might, have, might just kill your entire solution. So it's best to find out what is value for people as soon as possible. You need to test value quick and cheap. So if you have a value fo first focus, you could initially forget about styling. You should forget about scalability, maintainability, extensibility. They're all gone. You even might forget about coding. You remember this uh, 
tools uh, overview that I uh, presented earlier. I know, I know. This is a developer. Uh, this is a developer summit. How dare I not uh, to be talking about uh, uh, coding? How dare I not uh, to be uh, promoting non-coding solutions? Well, my my idea about it is the following: It's best to be creating something within ten hours uh, that you can test and put under the nose of people, and that will. Uh, get real usage value and value uh, that is measured by the feedback that you get then uh, developing in 100 hours and uh, having a, a code base that won't be used. I once provided value for a, a clinic uh, with the, the code, uh, the low code solutions. Um, Instead of uh, them having their users filling in a form on a tablet application and uh, getting uh, statistics real time about uh, what they were what they filled in and calculations that were put uh, on those, I created something simply within a couple of days using Google Forms. It was usable on a tablet in the waiting room. It, it, it shot information through Zapier, it, which is a SaaS that connects a lot of services. It uh, put its information to web merge that I had an Excel sheet waiting in that the calculations were put in. And that all resulted in a PDF that was sent through mail. And um, this really resulted in people filling in the form and in 15 minutes, they got this PDF about that person with a nice analysis and they could open the discussion with that patient in the clinic on how to go further from there. The difference and the value that I created was that I set up this entire solution, which was actually working in within two days. It was a usable solution, so we got real user feedback and the tweaking of the calculations and the solution was really easy. So, that way I provided way more value and cost way less than when I would have started to develop something in a framework, create a code, build it and deliver it. It was just too soon for that to do because the entire idea was uh, still in its uh, beginning phase. Of course you can code, but can you build 10 screen use user flow, uh, a 10 screen user flow with uh, within a couple of hours or a day and uh, can you uh, uh, publish it as fast and can you check it as fast if you can do it of course you can go ahead but what i'm start what i really uh, what re i really advocate is just don't start with coding per default think about the leanest way possible to implement a testable solution find out and experiment with it and test your assumptions and find the value before spending many coding hours. When you got a first version in uh, after that, you will have uh, your customer already going with a usable solution and you can start working out a coding solution that is best for the, for the uh, case. And that is what is called the value first mindset. So let me recap what I've been talking about here. I've been talking to you about the definition of value, uh, which is actually the importance and usefulness of something and the amount of money worth to other people for that, uh, which is quite similar to minimum viable product where minimal is the most useful uh, functionality and the viable part is uh, the part of functionality that people will actually pay for. When you see the combined process of uh, design thinking, lean startup and agile, it all comes down to pulling forward the defining moment of value. As soon as you have something that is hacked together, create with uh, no code and low, uh, low code or a very uh, simple coding solution, and you can put it in front of people, you will get actual feedback, actual user feedback, and uh, really, can get a grasp of if your solution is providing value to people. Uh, I've shown you examples of value. I've uh, discussed with you how you can increase value for others 
through the coders angle, using your expertise as a developer, your knowledge about the frameworks, your knowledge about um, all the, 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 the tools that are available and about the uh, hardware that is possible with mobile uh, applications. Um, I've discussed about you how the consultant angle uh, will add to that through the uh, interviewing and discussions you have with actual users. You can use tools like the five whys, the golden circle, and I've given you a resource of the mom test to find out how you can get the conversation going without biasing the conversation and getting false negatives. And I've discussed with you the value first mindset, which is really about not putting the code creation first, but focusing on value first. Uh, and that is by providing real workable solutions as fast and as cheap as possible to get people uh, really giving you uh, feedback on how they are experiencing the product, how they are experience, experiencing you, the solution that you are uh, providing and iterating from that. So with this recap, I would like to uh, to, uh, to finish my uh, presentation. I really hope you uh, enjoyed my talk and got inspired and got some really nice ideas on how to take the next interview and the next discussion with your customers and users to another level. And if you have any questions, I will be in the Q&A that is uh, up next. Um, so for that, I thank you for your time and all, all your uh, interest. And uh, as my creator goes, create value first. Thank you, Edwin. I think that was really nice presentation. And I think like that make us all think what we are creating and why we are that doing. And just curious, um, like there mentioned that you are like owner of EK online and you're also like taking care of creating value. So uh, what's your company about? Uh, my company is about uh, yeah, value creation as well, but um, to give you an example is, is perhaps the best thing to do is uh, the couple, last couple of years, because um, my business is just over a year old, I've been working on things like mentoring uh, people with an app idea that uh, didn't know how to approach it, they didn't have a tech uh, background, and I just help them through mentoring on the different phases of the different possibilities on how to create a solution that worked for them. It ended up for my last customer, for instance, actually using a non-coding solution for himself and saved him like 15K of money while iterating on his idea. Um, I also have been uh, developing remotely, of course, because um, uh, as a developer, it's also good that when there is a clear solution and a clear way to provide value, uh, that I can uh, provide it through a development. Um, and what, one thing that I also uh, lo love to do and do a, a, a couple of times, uh, did, a, did a couple of times, is uh, creating a, a, a blueprint of an idea. So uh, when people have ideas, businesses have ideas for a mobile app, they don't know uh, how to create a cross-platform solution. I uh, go with them uh, nowadays in a remote session of Max for hours. We dive into the problem. We try to find out using the five whys, the golden circle, etc., where their value lies. And I will put all that information into a well-spec blueprint with uh, uh, architecture uh, uh, overview with uh, wireframes of the basic solution and the basic concepts of the solution. So they can take that bundle of information and uh, 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 take a developer team alongside to create it so those are about things that i uh, did uh, in, the, in the last period there were all different angles and different means of creating value for uh, other people and besides that uh, i love to create my own uh, applications and solutions always working on that so it sounds amazing and yeah and it mentioned that you like been developing for 17 and maybe like even more years and uh I'm just curious at what moment uh, you came with the idea that you have you should uh, make sense first, not just coding. So how yeah. is it going? <laughs> it just aha moment or, or what? <laughs> no, it was a, a, a good question. It was really uh, gradually, of course, because in the beginning, when you are starting out as a developer, it feels like, 
oh, geez, I need to make uh, a software for a living. You start developing and uh, at the beginning, everybody I think is, is somewhat insecure and you can find a safe haven in diving behind your laptop, working on code, creating stuff, building stuff. And while you are doing that, you learn to master coding as a general whole. You, you learn how to develop and you learn uh, specific frameworks uh, for me for instance uh, i'm quite uh, uh, very in my kit shoes on uh, flutter uh, but you need to uh, get comfortable comfortable with that by just trying things and developing and after a while i noticed that uh, i got uh, uh, i got better at developing i got more comfortable and then i was like well i don't have to spend as much time on coding itself i can discuss more with people. So I was more open to work to business people, to, to uh, customers, and really start a conversation with them. Uh, and uh, when you are comfortable of your technical knowledge, you can focus more on interacting with other people. Uh, so that was like after uh, somewhere five to 10 years that I got really comfortable, uh, the conversations went better, and I noticed that I start to uh, ask the right questions to. Uh, take a deep dive in all of those things. And uh, after a while, I noticed that uh, there is an underlying thing more important than just developing. It's creating value for people. And nowadays, the tools and services that are provided and all the frameworks that we as developers get uh, put in, in our labs, they just enable us to have more time and more joy and uh, quicker access to uh, means to build value for others. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, perfect. I, I know. I do love such, you know, personal stories and how it goes, like how do you come to some particular point in life? And uh, from the applause in our comments, I think that yeah, like, your talk was really valuable for our guests. And uh, for this point, I'm like thanking you for this talk. Uh, and uh, I'm not letting you go because now we're like starting our uh, beloved part uh, of the of our summit, so Q and A session. I'm adding our previous speaker, uh, my young, who is somewhere not with us at the moment, and we are waiting for one one more speaker, Roy. I hope he'll join us in the nearest time. Oh yeah. Hi. Hi again. <laughs> Hi, I hope you can hear me now. Hi. Yeah, again. we can hear you. So actually, <clears throat> sorry. Hi, Mayank. Um, is there like any chance you have met uh, before on some other summits? Or is it yeah, like first time because we had like really cool but three different topics in this block and I think like we'll have a really cool Q and A session. It's not for me actually. I didn't met it actually. Um, usually I was giving the uh, content and tech talks onto my community uh, that we are having in EPAM, but this was my first time. It was a great experience. Usually, uh, I haven't interacted in such a sort of a forum before, but this is extraordinary, I can say. Uh, OK, uh, I think like uh, we can uh, we can wait a couple uh, more minutes for Roy, who was like our first speaker. And uh, in the meanwhile, I hope you're all doing well and you're all healthy and safe in all regions of the world because it's like a really actual like nowadays issue <laughs> I would say and it's like really really cool that we can uh, we have opportunity to have uh, such kind of online events and to share the experience to share the knowledge uh, so um this Q&A session uh, closes uh, our React Native first uh, block at this event. Uh, I would start uh, from uh, some question to Mayank. Uh, 
I think uh, we can uh, do like next that I'm asking a question and you can add some comments. You can have some discussion because, you know, like all these live talks, it's uh, super useful and super exciting for all our uh, attendees. And I'm reminding uh, that if you have any question, please uh, put them immediately in the chat because we have like 40 minutes for our session and then we'll continue with uh, Flutter block. Uh, so um, question was uh, for my young and it sounds like uh, how can you use 3D objects in React Native, especially with Android devices? Yeah, thank you, Anna. So uh, see, there are a few options uh, to display 3D object uh, without using Expo, right? So Expo is a sort of an environment, but uh, still there are some couple of libraries I have used it in my experience. So some of them I can name it uh, React Native 3D Model View is one of them. And the another one is 3JS. It's very much handy when it comes to the React Native. So those two libraries that you can freely use uh, when you just wanted to achieve something 3D in terms of your NIAC creative development. Okay, Edwin, do you have something to add? Uh, not really on that, but uh, I guess it's a, it's a great uh, example of uh, micro value creation because uh, <laughs> it's, it's like the, these kind of uh, additions to a framework uh, can really make you uh, speed up your development. So. Uh, I think that that's where the, the, there is a common intersection between our presentations. It's uh, uh, React Native is one is a is a great uh, platform. It is a great framework that enables developers to uh, build faster. You don't have to think about all the underlying plumbing, and you can create uh, screens, functionality, and solutions uh, way faster, which uh, gives us all more time to focus on uh, deciding what is real value from that application that you are creating. So. And I think here is like more uh, general question for both of you uh, we have from our uh, guests. Uh, so how hard is React Native for Flutter developer? Also what is like, how can he learn that? <laughs> Edwin, I propose you to answer first and then I'll follow you up. <laughs> Well, uh, my experience is uh, actually the other way around. Um, so uh, one of the main differences between those two is, of course, the, the, the syntax and language that you're being used, where Flutter uses Dart and React Native uses JavaScript. Uh, it's, it's, uh, uh, that is one of the, the, the first things you will encounter that you will need to uh, dive into. Um, how hard it is? Well. If you go look on their uh, on their uh, main pages, you will quickly find a lot of tutorial. And nowadays, there is a lot of uh, really good starting uh, content out there, both on their uh, official pages and when you Google around. So uh, getting up and going with the framework isn't as hard as it used to be in, uh, back in the day. Um, especially if you look for Flutter, they have a lot of uh, uh, example projects on their website. You can just download uh, the one that suits your uh, product idea the most and start iterating and working on that. So I think that is really a, a, an advantage that they have from the get-go. Um, and uh, also things like uh, animation and styling, look and feel. Uh, there is already a lot of in there uh, from the get-go, when you, once you start with uh, with your solution, uh, leaving you with uh, more time to uh, code logic instead of tweaking the interface, etc. Yeah. So I think in addition to that, you know, uh, for me the experience was a bit different, and uh, because see, uh, React Native is completely a JavaScript uh, sort of tech stack, and when it comes to the Flutter. Uh, it's completely a different one because JavaScript need a bridge to compile the solution and then give it to the native operating system and then it's gonna render it. But Dart is something different, right? Dart, Dart is itself rendering onto the uh, native operating system and they don't have any sort of bridge. Whatever you'll be writing in Dart, it will be completely running onto a native operating system. That's why the code syntax and the mechanism that they are following onto the Dart is a bit different in comparison to the React Native, where we are using JavaScript, right? 
So it's not hard. You should have some basic concepts that you are using onto your coding practices, and then you can go ahead with that. But before that, as I mentioned in my uh, session as well, that you should have a JavaScript knowledge for sure for uh, getting started with React Native. Yeah. And, uh, we have like question uh, previously in the chat. Uh, so does uh, JavaScript knowledge help learning React Native? As we are like talking about how to begin with. Yeah, I think it really does because if you if you know the basic understanding of JavaScript and you have a, have a grasp of how you can use it to structure code and uh, how to implement functionality, of course, then uh, React Native won't be much more than hooking up uh, framework functionality uh, fr uh, through uh, functionality that is provided by the framework, uh, and it will help to uh, help you to get going faster with uh, React Native, of course. Uh, just as uh, learning any language will help you to interact with uh, with people uh, in a certain country. So uh, I think that that for sure will help uh, a lot. And, uh, one... uh, that's the same thing, uh, Anna, that Edwin has explained. So like you, you should learn at least anything to, to, to be better at React Native, yeah? <laughs> I completely got you. <laughs> Okay, and, oh, and, and, and if I can uh, add something to that, one uh, other uh, advantage when you know JavaScript, of course, is that you know how to debug uh, debug your solutions with JavaScript. Uh, if you've been using it, you know how to uh, uh, to test run it, to to, to uh, find uh, issues and and bugs, uh, uh, and that will really uh, speed up uh, your way of working with React Native. Okay, thank you. And uh, one more question as we're like talking for React Native and Flutter. We have a question, uh, does React Native have plugins and packages like Flutter? Uh, yeah, um, it is actually. React Native has a number of libraries and some popular libraries. I can say that, uh, that uh, you are having Material UI, right? You are having React Native map view and for some uh, adobe after effect animation and all those you'll be having a lottie i guess so yeah some couple of libraries uh, which comes uh, in a very popular way when you are getting started with react native right so yeah the same way they are not having the plugin we are having a set of libraries that we are just integrating with the react and we just plug and play and we can use this functionality the way they are giving their apis and all those sort of stuff I can agree. <laughs> yeah, I agree yeah. totally. Sure. <laughs> okay, perfect. Nothing to add. <laughs> so we'll leave Flutter for now, and we have like question I like saw in chat maybe a couple of times for this uh, like three talks of you. So guys, React and Angular. <laughs> oh, very nice. React and Angular or and uh, React Native. Okay, I'll get started with this one. Uh, this one uh, specifically to the angular right angular is is just a sort of a framework but when it comes to the react not react native i, I can say react is just a library the same way that we are having the field with the jquery you can just put it into your code and you can use it without affecting the rest of the structure that you are using it okay so but angular is different it is having some sort of structure that we need to follow it's a sort of that bridge that we need to make it between the components to make them communicate in a very healthy manner okay so there are those those are two different tech stacks uh, but both are ultimately running onto the browser uh, technologies javascript html css and other stuff right because ultimately the browser browser will understand at the end only javascript html and css nothing more than that no angular no react nothing is there only it will understand those three languages and then you make a comparison between the coding standards, uh, robustness, data binding, and feasibility when it comes to the libraries and in terms of Angular, you will be having some code snippets that you're getting it uh, onto the open source community. So these are the some comparisons that you need to make it. But when you're getting a TIFF requirement, right, you should properly, or I can say thoroughly investigate it, which tech stack is good, what you want to achieve it ultimately with that particular uh, problem statement and ultimately what you're going to get when you get started either with angular or react yeah 
I have, I have not nothing really to add to that. Um, what I, what I really noticed myself is that uh, it's more of a, a different kind of philosophy in in the, in the core where React has a different setup. Uh, it's comparable to Angular, but it has a setup that is, is really strongly component based. And uh, if you use that uh, set, uh, that philosophy to build your uh, solutions, you will get really uh, reusable components that are all uh, set up in a similar way to the standards of React. And uh, Angular is tending more to be something uh, going to JavaScript where uh, you can build it any way you want. You, it is more robust and it has less guiding lines that will help you to create a solution. So I think that React is somewhat more of a stronger philosophy and it will uh, guide you more into creating uh, uh, cross-platform solutions. Okay, Edwin, and you can like continue directly because I have a question for you. So where you usually get ideas, problems to solve? Uh, that's a good one. This is uh, this is something that really uh, is, is uh, a very common question be between the makers, entrepreneur uh, world, the indie developers. Um, a lot of ideas that I create is, uh, well, at first, uh, st uh, starting by scratching your own itch. Yeah? It's a principle that, uh, <laughs> that has been uh, more and more popular the last years. Um, if you have a problem in your day-to-day -day life, I uh, usually uh, tend to uh, uh, ignore it and go on. But if something is keeping me uh, awake or if, if a problem is reoccurring over time, then I tend to write it down. I, I have this uh, Trello board full of, of stuff that is bugging me, uh, technical solutions that uh, that I am missing. And th th those can be like very small tools, but also like hmm, if I would have like this, for instance, uh, for this question, if I would have an idea creation solution, uh, how would that look like? If you write all those ideas down, um, it, 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 that, that's just one, one pro tip that I can give. It will help you to, uh, get a, a bunch of ideas and uh, over time I really tend to iterate on that list. So I have like this backlog with over 30, 40 ideas and I iterate and investigate which ones I can uh, create uh, the most value from for me and for others, also making a viable product. And I will tend to uh, move it up right to the next column, which is uh, investigate and create uh, a test version and create an MVP, etc. cetera. Um, so um, scratching your own itch is one uh, way to find ideas. And another one is uh, through a means that I've been uh, 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 saying a lot through my presentation, talking to people. If you walk around uh, uh, on the street or uh, nowadays, if you are Zooming with your colleagues, ask what is bugging them, ask what is, uh, uh, missing what what kind of tool they could use what kind of solution they are missing if you uh, talk to people you will find a lot of hidden uh, ideas in in there and often problems tend to uh, need the ideas for development but also if someone is using a problem solution already some kind of SaaS product or a software product ask about what they like about it ask what they don't like about it and if you have uh, a really big no-no for our application and they say like yeah i love this product but this aspect i really hate if it could be something more like this or this there is another idea you can in, uh, implement there is another solution that you could create and you could create a better version of product x y or z so those are the most uh, common ways for me to find ideas i don't know if uh, uh, you if know i think i think that like Communicating with people, asking them what their like needs is maybe key to success in every field, not just developing some app and uh, like making it better, but really like everywhere. Yeah, for sure. So a uh, good question from Rosalind. Yeah, like here we come one more. So is that would be easier to design totally custom UI? In terms of absolute placement, making them come. And here, one more comment that um, breaking out of rows and columns. 
Um, what I would like to specify first is like Dart is the language, and uh, I think what is meant here perhaps is uh, the, that Flutter, the framework which uses Dart as language, has building blocks. It has like a lot of functional uh, stuff, a lot of uh, visual building blocks that you can use to create applications fast. Um, if you want to create an application re really fast, Flutter has great means to do that, and you can really uh, create screens fast, create a user flow. Um, if you want to have something that is uh, really uncommon uh, and not inherent to those building blocks that Flutter, for instance, uh, provides, then of course you would need to do uh, one of two things. You can either find out if there are developers who have already created usable building blocks for you, so you can integrate them, or you would need to create those things yourself. So uh, subscribing uh, to the uncommon keyword here, I think uh, that uh, Richard Dear Flame is asking uh, how hard is it to build your custom blocks and your custom uh, elements in Flutter? Um, well, it, it, it isn't really that hard. Um, also because they have a lot of examples and you can find a lot of content now already, even while Flutter is still a young framework that's uh, really uh, tutor, tutor you in how to create those elements. Um, so I think it all depends on what you really want to create, but uh, uh, a lot of things are possible in Flutter. Don't know if you have anything to add to that. I agree with that, absolutely. <laughs> okay, then here comes like next question. So please, advice. <laughs> Um, yeah, to add it to that point, right? Uh, first of all, uh, if uh, someone is learning the web development, for sure they are uh, targeting for HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Those are tech stacks which most of the platforms nowadays are using. You can create a desktop based application, you can use web based application, you can use uh, backend services. And you can run anywhere, right? So it will be very good that if you are dealing the web development tech stacks, uh, then you can go ahead with that. And along with that, what I'm suggesting is just try more and more complex scenarios, right? A very day-to-day uh, -day problem statement, I can say. So if you are starting a, a sort of a web development tech stack, then try to find out some problem statement that you are de that you are de dealing daily, right? Some sort of a chat box or to-do list to do list in your own way, right? There are a couple of uh, ideas when you get started with to-do list. It's not like someone said it get started with to-do list, right? So it's not something that was already written. When you get started with any sort of problem statement, you get ideas onto this again and again, okay? You get uh, involved into this one, putting the features, uh, running behind them, getting the errors, run for those errors, find out the solution, uh, uh, evolve from those one and then ha that's how you get started with this one so that's what the suggestion from my side so the, uh, even i follow the same stuff so <laughs> i thought from my thing yeah i really so agree that's a, a good starting point um in addition to that i think it's it's really also important to know that um when you're learning web development nowadays uh, mobile and web development are really merging it's becoming uh, uh, one universe, if you will, of, of development uh, solutions. Um, hence the cross-platform uh, development uh, summit uh, and, and all the content uh, available online. Um, those are clear indications that these things are merging. But one key difference when you start developing for mobile, for the mobile form factor for mobile platforms, iOS, Android, perhaps even Windows, um, is that uh, those platforms are different from what you see in your browser because they have a common language that they use to uh, to uh, uh, interact with their users. If you open up an uh, Android telephone and use an Android app, you will see differences from uh, the same application on iOS. Um, those are platform-specific uh, characteristics and there is one thing that can be taught from the 
uh, generic uh, frameworks like React and Flutter is how are users on a framework like iOS or Android used to be interacting with the application. Uh, if you understand the basics for those platforms, and they're not really hard, but you need to see them and understand them. Once you grasp how an Android application uh, most of the time looks like and interacts with users, do the same for the iOS uh, framework, then you will have a basic understanding of interaction models, of uh, screen setups, and you could use that to uh, transition your web development knowledge into building for those platforms. So I think that's one of the things that was hardest for me back in the day to start developing for native um, iOS at the beginning. The screens look different. There is a, a, a less window that you can look at. There's really less screen estate and you have to create functionality in a different way instead of uh, uh, an overview with all kinds of buttons beside them and, and indicators, you might have to break up those screens into multiple screens in a logical uh, uh, flow. So uh, those are the things that I found hardest when transitioning from web into mobile development. OK, thank you. I think that's a like really full answer for this question. And one more from Asher, like which was asked a couple of times. So I think that's like really important to know. Uh, Microsoft Xamarin. Um, <laughs> I tell you a secret. I've been using Xamarin a lot in the last five years or so, even through my uh, consultancy years. Um, is it better? I think it, it always depends. Uh, when you look at Xamarin, um, I think it really has a, a, a good purpose. Uh, you can find examples of really beautiful uh, visualized applications with nice animations, but all those things aren't baked in from the beginning. When I spin up a Flutter solution or a React Native solution and you start uh, creating screens, they often tend to look already nice from the beginning. Whereas in uh, Xamarin, uh, I really had to put in more effort to create a default styling, create a default animations, uh, uh, fonts uh, have to be imported, et cetera, all those kind of things. So the visual layer takes somewhat more effort to get right. Uh, since Xamarin also created uh, Xamarin Forms, which is an abstraction layer in which you can create uh, uh, screen setups in, in either code or uh, XAML. It's an XML-based uh, variant. Uh, XAML generates uh, your screen setup, so the way you define your screen, and uh, uh, creates it both for Android and iOS using the components that are most common for those platforms. So if you want to be more close to uh, how the native OS uh, looks and feels and interacts with users. Uh, Xamarin Forms tends to provide an interface that is more close to that, but it's less flashy. So um, those are kind of the, the, the things that you need to take into consideration to decide if that is better for your solution or not. Agreed. Yeah, some, some of the other benefits also when you get started uh, with Xamarin, right? So some other benefits you are be getting, right? Uh, some of them are uh, one technology tech stack code, the same thing uh, that you're getting it from the hybrid app development. And then you'll be getting some sort of native uh, UI feel, the way that you are getting a feel from the native uh, mobile applications, the same way that you're getting for uh, Xamarin as well. The other thing which, I found more, most interesting in terms of Xamarin is it offers full hardware support. So in, in terms of Flutter and React, I found some sort of difficulty whenever I just wanted to have an integration for hardware. But in terms of Xamarin, it is very handy. It is very easy to integrate any sort of hardware which is available onto your uh, mobile app, mobile one, or it is, if it is offering by native operating system, you can use those in a very um, easy way, I can say. And anyhow, it is open source, so you can use it for sure. Yeah, totally agree. Uh, agree with, uh, with with what you're saying. Um, 
because uh, C is the base language that uh, the was before uh, object-oriented programming was there. A lot of uh, uh, embedded software is still written in C for its low uh, memory usage and in speed. Uh, so integrating and connecting with all those uh, IoT devices and uh, all those uh, um, uh, hardware uh, devices with uh, software running on them uh, is easier overall indeed um, so yeah I agree with that thank you for your answers guys and like small remark you know like what do I love about Geekle's team is that like we are really involved in all the events so uh, all the communities managers who are like not responsible for cross-platform are also watching our event and here I saw a question for uh, from our Python community manager, Victoria. It's addressed to Edwin, but I think it's also like be relevant for my young. So please, could you answer for that? So what challenges you faced with uh, when you started using React Native? Um, well, the first challenge was that I had to deep dive. Uh, I only started using React Native like last year or something. Uh, because of there was a, an existing uh, React Native application and it, it didn't work anymore because it wasn't maintained and it was really uh, deprecated, etc. So uh, the challenge that I faced when using React Native was that it it, it just didn't compile anymore. Um, and then I found out I had to uh, not only install the framework and the, the basic toolset. Uh, I also had to uh, upgrade the project. I had to upgrade the web layer and all the uh, the components that were used in the application. Then I noticed that there were deprecated things because in React Native you have like the web-based layer uh, there that that exists out of a lot of web components and uh, and tools that are being upgraded and maintained and improved over time. Uh, so there are a lot of different variables in that framework that you need to be uh, aware of. You need to be aware of the functionality and the code about the frameworks and the components that are used and about React Native's uh, own uh, uh, evolving. And uh, that sometimes means that functions are being deprecated or that stuff is being placed in other modules, etc. And that can really uh, uh, be hard to dive into. On the other side, I, because I dove in uh, nose first uh, deep uh, with this, I really got to learn all those different aspects of the framework. And once I knew what they were and how to use them for uh, uh, creating the new version of the application and imp imp implementing a better version, uh, I was good to go. So um, being aware of that you need to maintain different uh, levels in your application, both web, uh, web components, uh, React Native and uh, language stuff is something that uh, really was an eye opener for me. And uh, did you consider any other alternatives? Uh, um, well, I have a, a, a long history in C Sharp, so Xamarin also was considered, and of course also Flutter, because uh, uh, I really did see and, and notice how fast you can build stuff in Flutter. But uh, for the time being, I didn't have to uh, uh, use another alternative yet. And Mayank, what about you? Same sort of experience, uh, Anna. But here, in addition to that, right? Um, when we just wanted to get started with the React Native, yeah, some of the challenges that I faced it, right, in terms of operating system specificity, specificity in the sense when you just wanted to gather the hardware interaction for iOS devices and Android, uh, I feel some sort of glitch is there, permission glitches and uh, 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 some code tweaks also that I need to do. Those are sort of the challenges, right? So if you, uh, as I'm just mentioning it again and again, if your architecture and the, the, the code structure that you are writing it for uh, your application that's going to use into the iOS plus Android both, uh, it would be very healthy then, then you're not going to face much challenge. But in initial days, when you starting it from scratch, those point of time, probably you might face some of the issues. And then when you uh, find out some of the uh, uh, logs into your, um, 
I can say uh, st stack traces. Then you learn more about that, how it can be tweaked, it, what should I place it, where should I place it, and how it should be get communicated, it, right? So those are the challenges I have faced it on, at that point of time, but now it's good. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we have like less than 10 minutes left, time flies, and I propose you like to have two more questions, and here is one more like practical, I would say. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. If, if, if I may start, I think this is this is something common to uh, every framework is that that as as time goes and uh, things become better in a framework, uh, it gets more uh, more grown up. The community uh, grows and people start working on the framework itself, help building it and growing it. Um, of course, the, the the framework itself will become more stable. And there is always this common sense of what a framework should do and should be like. Uh, and the advantage of younger frameworks like Flutter is that uh, they start with all the best practices and all the knowledge from all the other frameworks around. They put that together and create a beautiful new framework. But uh, for since this is about React Native, yeah, React Native uh, has been performing some some great changes uh, because uh, design practices and, and uh, development practices have been changing as well. Uh, they implemented a lot of stuff, made it easier to uh, reuse components, made it easier to integrate uh, uh, modules and solutions in your application. Uh, all the building blocks have really cleaned up and, and, and are performing more and more uh, uh, over time, uh, so I also think that this is inherent and that it, uh, that uh, breaking changes will likely be uh, occurring less and less. Um, so yeah, answer is yes. <laughs> Young, do you have something to add to this question? Well, no, I agreed. Uh, yeah, some such challenges. That's why they are making it open source, right? They just wanted to make it more and more healthy. Uh, uh, based on the contribution that developers are doing it, right? So yeah, some of the things that was not feasible feasible in terms of React Native, they have deprecated it, like navigations and some other stuff. They 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 uh, bring it up some more healthy things onto the React Native platform, and they are using it right now. But yeah, as it is a newer framework, almost four years, three to four years, uh, it's still evolving it, I can say. There are a lot of things that need to be achieved in a couple of years, and then probably it's going to be best one. Okay, thank you. And as we have like a lot of questions, more to answer, but uh, unfortunately no time. So as we are like uh, talking at junior track, I would choose one question, uh, which is maybe like really important for beginners and for young people who are just wanting like to start the coding. So it's like more, uh, more like a general question to discuss. It is, it is. Erwin, you want to go ahead? I'll follow you up then. Sure. Um, nobody's perfect. That's that's for sure as well. Um, I think, um, especially what I talked about in my presentation is uh, there are so many low code and no coding solutions right now. So creating value and building something useful that people can actually use within their uh, company or build for their users is like so easy nowadays where you had to like build for weeks uh, in the past your own framework your own solution i had to uh, 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 provide it on the internet or some way else or distribute uh, software it has all changed with one click at a button, you can start a no-code uh, mobile app solution, or you can spin up if you're a more uh, experienced developer uh, framework like React or Flutter and start your basic application. Within a couple of days, you have something that will work. Um, and besides the tools that are being provided, the amount of content on uh, online nowadays is so immense. If you have YouTube channels, you have tutorial websites, you have uh, people like uh, uh, 
uh, Ray Wendell Lake's uh, website that, that provide iOS and Android tutorials to build in Flutter or whatever language that you like. Uh, there's so much at hand that people can nowadays use. I think the most difficult thing right now is finding the right uh, resources to be starting with. I think that's more difficult than the actual development nowadays. So I don't think that you should catch Harvard. I, I graduated as, as a, a developer, as a, as a tech engineer myself in the day. But uh, nowadays, I think a lot of things I learned there could be Googled right away. And uh, all the basic concepts that I learned there uh, can be found online. So yes, you can grab a study or go to Harvard, but I think that will be a deepening session nowadays and not if you want to be a generic developer going well, uh, something that is absolutely necessary. Completely agree that. Usually, see, there is no uh, age for learning, right? You can get started anytime. But as Edwin said, that you need to find out the right path, the right thing that you wanted to achieve, and you just need to follow the stuff and then uh, bring something out of it. Just stick to those, practice more onto things, and get practical, right? Get practical, just find out the real-time problems. Uh, try to give a solution to those, and then you'll get handy with those sort of thing. But I don't say that. Even I'm not expertise on that particular thing. But uh, graduation is something different, right? And learning is something different. Learning can be for anything. can be for anything like coding or architectural thing or just UI, UX. It's not about only the information technology thing, but something, any other thing, right? IoT stuff and something. So you can get started any point of time. You just need to follow things and you need to have your determination and dedica dedication. And then, just, yeah, that's it, I guess. Perfect. That I, I think that was like really a good question to like make a point in uh, our <laughs> conversation for today. And I'm like really thankful uh, for you guys to like to spend your time with us together on our um, official Geekal web pages. Uh, you can find uh, my youngs and Edwin's uh, social links, so you can add them to your friends and uh, like follow them uh, with any updates and news. So thank you one more time. And and uh, I'm saying goodbye to you for today and wish you a great day. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. Thank you so much. And guys, I'm really thankful for you to be with me for these three hours. And uh, I'm saying goodbye to you also and wish you a great summit then and uh, next block with Flasha. So bye-bye. Hi, hi everyone. My name is Victoria and I'm going to be the moderator of this event for the next couple of hours. I hope you can see and hear me well. In any case, just let me know in the comments below in case you're facing any technical issues. And I'm sure that you are ready to get a lot of new and fresh and valuable information from our next speaker. And our next speaker is Majin Hajan. Hi, Majid. So, hello, Majid. Yes, Majid is 
passionate software developer with years of developing and architecting complex web and mobile applications. His patients are generally Flutter, PWA, and Performance. He's an award-winning book author of the progressive web app with Angular by the APRES, an instructor at Backpub, Udemy, and Prudelstein. He loves sharing his knowledge with the community by writing and speaking, having workshops and video tutorials, contributing to open source and organizing meetups and events. He is also the organizer of several big Nordic conferences and meetups such as Flutter Vikings. Majid is going to present us his topic, Flutter up and running. Are you ready, Majid? Absolutely, I am. How are you doing today? How is your mood? Very. Yes, uh, I'm so excited for uh, this session. Uh, let's see how it goes. Uh, at the end uh, of the session, we're going to have a live coding. So uh, oh, hope everyone enjoy that. Amazing. Yes. Nice. So let's start. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, can I just ask uh, you moderators if uh, you don't hear me very well? Uh, or uh, any problem with the screen, just let yes, me know. Yes, yes, okay? yes, we'll let you know and for sure. Sure. I think I shared my screen uh, and you can uh, move on to that part. Shall I start? Yes, yes sure, you can start. Can, can you also uh, bring up the um, presentation to the screen? Uh, yes. Very good. Let's get it started then. <clears throat> All right, so we're going to talk about actually Flutter. So in this session, uh, my main goal is to get you up and running. You see that how fast you can start working with the Flutter, even though you may not know anything. So this talk is uh, very, very uh, somehow suitable for those who uh, hasn't done anything with Flutter yet and they want to see like how fast and how and where should they start uh, developing with Flutter. So let's move on. Uh, I don't think like today it's uh, a day that you are learning quite a lot of things about Flutter and React Native, right? So and perhaps you participated in some other sessions and you learned about Flutter already. So I'm not going to go through that like a reasoning of why you need to use Flutter. Um, but as a Flutter passionate, so uh, I encourage you to still learn about Flutter and give it a try. But then the, another question might be like, what can we do with Flutter? So in fact, uh, Flutter can do these days quite a lot of things from having uh, apps like this one on the web because flutter can also compile to web as well as you know windows linux mac and android and ios and this is made by one of the speakers the one of the first speaker uh, today or uh, you see that uh, other examples like this one which i can actually play with that live right now you see how smooth is running even though it's running on the web but it's built by flutter or uh, you may have seen actually examples like this one, more complex one, which is built by Flutter. Animation is very smooth. You can simply work with it and like that. You can like make a lot of uh, complex animation. And uh, of course, uh, it's not just that. You can fully build an uh, application like you can clone a Facebook app. There are lots of other clones built by Flutter already, so you can go ahead and check it out. And that's not only uh, right now, this is a browser based, you know, uh, app, Facebook app. You just can play with this in my presentation later. But of course, uh, you can also compile it to web uh, and mobile, right? So you can have the mobile version of it, even the responsive version of the uh, mobile. So you see that Flutter uh, for both uh, Android and iOS, web and maybe other platforms is quite powerful. So everything is done also in one single code base. So in this uh, session, uh, we're going to talk about like, uh, 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 we're going to talk about like uh, the, the basic of Dart. So I want to like teach you 
uh, or tell you how you can start with Dart if you haven't done anything yet. Uh, we're gonna just uh, move on to some essential uh, widgets for, for uh, Flutter as well. Uh, if we get time in the live coding, we go for Navigator, REST API and serializing. So let's see how it goes. But if we don't have time, then we just run a very simple app at the end with a live coding. And we just build a one or two a screen. You see that how we can quickly do it in, I have 40 minutes, so let's see how we can do it fast. So, um, but let me introduce myself first. My, as uh, I was introduced, let's uh, quickly move on. My name is Majid Hajian. I'm based in Oslo, passionate developer, uh, especially advocating for Flutter and uh, also organizing a couple of conferences, which one of the most important one before we move on is Flutter Vikings, which is happening next week. And if you learned a lot of stuff today in this conference and you want to skill up and, and level up uh, your knowledge about Flutter, just a decade about Flutter, join us and let's have some fun over there. But let's move on and talk about Dart. Dart is relatively uh, an advanced and also an easy language. So you can easily pick that up. I This session, it's not about Dart. We're not just going to talk about in Dart in depth and how you can do. But what I want to do is I want to just tell you like how easy you can start with Dart and at least gives you some basic information about that. So you know, all right, if you want to start right now or today with Flutter, you know the basics. You don't need to go ahead and, and uh, learn Dart first. First thing first is that you can run Dart in the browsers as well. If you go to Dart Pad, you can run your Dart code and you can see the result. So that's also very nice. If you want to play with Dart and you don't want to install anything, just want to um, get to know Dart a little bit, just you can try a Dart Pad and, and see how it uh, works. But let's go through the basic of the programming with Dart. The first thing that I can mention is the types uh, or in, in the Dart. In Dart languages, like similar to other languages, if you are familiar with any languages or uh, you're coming from web with JavaScript, TypeScript, or I don't know, Java, or Go, or other languages, you may be familiar with the primitive types. Like you may know string, you know Boolean, integer, double, number, map, list, and all of these types. So this is not something very strange when you come to Dart. So it's similar things. So you can just uh, have a similar name as well. Sometimes the way that you write them is a bit different. Like in TypeScript, maybe you say Boolean, but in, in uh, Dart, you just say bool. The way that actually you, uh, assign, uh, you um, uh, say that a variable has a type is that you write your type first and then your variable name, and then you can assign any you know, value to your variable. <laughs> strings are one of the biggest uh, part of any languages, right? You want to play with strings and do a lot of things like that. So in Dart, similar again to other languages, you may have multi-line uh, uh, strings. Uh, so by adding uh, triple quotation, or you may have uh, like one line string like that. String interpolation also works in Dart as simple as just using a dollar sign before your variable and then you get uh, your uh, uh, your variable to be evaluated and executed. So another thing is, uh, as I told you, booleans are similar. So you have uh, true and false and then you can also react on that and have conditions, for instance, if some value is uh, true, by default, you can say it has value and, and you go ahead and do your check over there. List uh, R or arrays, uh, if you're familiar with that, or, or also are similar. Uh, so you define them in Dart uh, with uh, uh, the signs that you see, uh, or you can use a list constructor to create your uh, list. So there are different methods on list, of course, or array you can do and manipulate your list as well. Functions are 
uh, in any any languages you have function you define your function name and then you have your scope and you can just uh, do whatever you want inside that scope of the function you can pass parameters and also uh, in Dart, you have uh, uh, arrow syntax, so you can also use that as well. And functions are uh, uh, first class uh, objects, so it means that sometimes you can pass uh, functions as an argument to another function, which is an awesome uh, feature in Dart. So uh, you need to know when it comes to uh, Flutter, when you come to Flutter, you need to know actually uh, one of the most important things that you see it's name parameters where you define your parameters uh, like uh, the way that you see in the presentation right now you define your parameters you pass a value or uh, also assign a, like a type and then you go ahead and and check it out uh, in the parameter when you want to pass it by the name and so simply as an example here is bold you can just say is bold dot dot and and you say well true I pass it to your uh, function this is an awesome uh, feature in dart which makes it very easy to like it's somehow self-documented uh, uh, so you can simply go ahead and and define all of your parameters like uh, name parameters but the only thing is that they are not optional which you can with uh, required uh, uh, at sign required, you can make them also require. So positional parameters are the one like that uh, you are pretty familiar in many languages already. So it's not something new. Again, you see, when you see this code, you see that, oh, mm, okay, probably I know that. I have seen that already. So this is my attention, right? Uh, my intention right now. I just want to tell you like how easy you can just use this. Of course, uh, you can also have a check uh, of a type. Uh, you can uh, test your type with uh, is, uh, and you say that if this is an instance of that, and you can check it out and, and do what you want. So these are also very handy when it comes to checking the uh, class, for instance, the object. Well, uh, iterate uh, or loops are uh, iterative or loops are also in Dart, so you can simply use for uh, for loop. Uh, you are probably have seen that in your uh, uh, any language that you work with so far, or uh, for in which you can have a collection and iterate over that simply. There are also functions that uh, make it also easier for you to work, maybe uh, like for each or map, so you can run it on iteratable and, and uh, simply iterate over them. So, uh, of course, uh, catching errors is very important when it comes to building an application, right? So you need to know if you have these options in Dart, which definitely you have. You have try, catch, and finally. So where try and catch is uh, useful when you want to run something and if there is any error, uh, if any error happens, you want to catch it in, in the catch uh, uh, block, right? So in Dart, uh, with on keyword uh, and specifying which exception, you can also uh, particularly uh, catch uh, an exception about that particular, you know, uh, uh, object. For instance, here on socket exception gives you an ability to just react to a socket exception. Like for if, if there is no internet or something like and, and the error is thrown, so you can catch it here and do something with that. Maybe you want to define your exceptions and do something accordingly. You don't want to catch everything. Maybe you want to react, you know, on each exception and do something uh, uh, related to that problem. So, and classes. Well, Dart is, of course, an object-oriented programming. Classes are uh, there, and so you need, need to use them everywhere. And, uh, in fact, uh, classes are, uh, they have the similar concept as any other object-oriented programming. The only thing is that in Dart, I just want to make it so simple for you, is that the constructor is, uh, the name of constructor is not constructed, it's like, the name uh, is similar to the class name. Like as you see here, class person has a constructor which we can say person as well. And you pass your 
uh, parameters to to the class. You can uh, you have also other option. You can create abstract. You can extend. You can implement. These are the also the. Uh, principles of object oriented programming which you may be familiar and you have those options in Dart as well. And uh, in just maybe five minutes, six minutes, I just quickly overviewed the most fundamental things that you need to know when you get started with Dart. But as I wanted to show you is that this is very simple. So many of them are familiar you don't need to worry about like when when it comes to flutter say ah another language but in fact this language is not as difficult as you are thinking it's it's just way easy you can simply come and uh, start your uh, start coding with flutter and by just knowing these basics and and that's it and then when you do more of course you learn more but now we are moving on from Dart, so I encourage you then you go ahead and read more, but you don't need that. You just move on to the Flutter immediately and do Flutter stuff. Let's talk about Flutter a little bit and see uh, what are the fundamentals of Flutter when you want to start for the first time with Flutter. All right, then uh, the first thing first is the architecture. I'm not going to talk about the architecture for you because you are like, uh, okay, I'm expecting you want to start with Flutter right now. So at, the, at this point, it really doesn't matter how behind the scenes it works. It, it matters just you just go ahead and do something with Flutter and enjoy. So you're going to really enjoy building an app with Flutter, I promise. But first thing that everyone, when you come to Flutter, tell you is that Everything is a widget. But what does that mean when we say everything is a widget? I want to just emphasize here that this is not actually a new concept. If you are coming from web, for instance, because um, this conference is also about React Native and uh, Flutter, right? So I am expecting like many of you probably have already done uh, web stuff. So if you have done that, you're pretty much familiar with the concept of components in, in front end, right? Like maybe in uh, Vue or React or web component, for instance. So everything is a widget. It's somehow a similar concept. So, so you, have, you want to build your application just by doing widgets. So technically it's that. So if you're if you feel like you can say component, just go ahead and do component. But that's what we call it in Flutter. We say widget. So simply, if you want to create like, uh, let's say, a simple layout, like the one in the screen, you just need to, you know, what I'm trying to tell you right now is how you need to think when it comes to mobile development with Flutter. When you come to the uh, development, so you, 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 when you want to run a design or do a design, you, you need to think about that in this way. You say, okay, what I see in the screen, first of all, I see a row, all right, and that row has maybe several columns, which contains a button, and each button contains a text and an icon. Each of these you know, element that I just said, they are widgets. There is a widget equivalent to that in Flutter. There is a row widget, there is a, a button widget, there are a couple of them. There is an icon widget or a couple of them. There is a text widget, there is column widget, you know. So when you think about uh, your design, when you want to do it, you think like, oh, Okay, then here there is a button. Probably there should be a widget. All right, let's go and search, even if you don't know, you know? And when you search, okay, is there any button widget for Flutter? Yes, there is. And these are the buttons widget. You can go ahead and use them. So Flutter gives you a lot of UI elements. Like at the end of the day, it's a UI toolkit. So it makes easy for you to uh, use those things that you want to uh, design or create in your application. So perhaps I can say that most of the time you find some widgets already built in with material 
design uh, for instance and then you can find them and all of those widgets once you grab them you simply can go ahead and you know you can uh, modify them as much as you want and you can uh, try to make your design out of those pre-built one we'll see it in the live coding quickly at the end so but it's important you you know two important thing is that the first thing is uh, there is uh, two types of widgets in Flutter. First is stateless and second one is the stateful. Again, the concept is not that uh, unfamiliar perhaps to you. So stateless are the widgets that they accept something and they render. There is no state in that widget, but the stateful are the one that they rebuild uh, or uh, re-render when the state on that widget is changing. So this is simple concept again. Uh, examples are in the stateless, for instance, a text widget is the one that accepts just text and render. And, there, and you can create like a stateful widget, for instance, uh, scrollable, there is a state scroll and then once it's changing, something needs to you know change and, and rebuild again. So, and uh, <clears throat> this is the simplest app that you can right now just copy paste this and uh, see your app. And this is the simplest one that you can see. So technically you have uh, my app widget. So in Flutter, you need to know that there is one main file that contains main function. Okay, why? Because Dart, if you want to execute something, Dart needs to have a main function and inside the main function, so everything gets executed. So therefore, when you want to actually run a Flutter app, you need to have a main function, at least uh, like in one file, main dart dart, for instance, as a default one. And uh, use run app, which is a, a function from Flutter uh, as well. And you pass your first widget, which could be this widget that you are seeing right now. This is a statelet widget that returns a material app and, and uh, have some body, scaffold, and title. You, you, you see what I'm going to do with this in the live code in, in a few seconds. But before we move on, now you understand that, okay, you know, when you want to start, then you have a main function and that main function gets a run app, which accepts the first widget you want to render. And the, the journey will start from there. So, so the my app is the most and the main uh, app, which is returning material app. And from now on, I can have several other screens, routing and things like that. That's very good. So that's the first uh, basic. <clears throat> so uh, like I said, you can then now have routings, create your, your the other routes and screens and just go ahead and do that, uh, uh, render other stuff in the different, based on the different routes. So there are a lot of built-in widgets already for you, at least in the material app. So the material design is already uh, built in uh, for Flutter with a lot of widgets. So you have for almost everything that you need. So you can go ahead and grab them from uh, Flutter. Like uh, these are the simple ones that you see right now in the screen. There are more advanced ones which you can go ahead and grab them. So. If you are thinking about a design and you think, okay, that might need a column, just go ahead and search for a column and you probably will find them in uh, the material design. Let's uh, move on, like how you can set up your environment. You can quickly go ahead and uh, first of all, it's very basic again, you need to download the SDK, update your pass, if, if you want to use Android Studio or anything else, but anyway, you need to have uh, Android Studio installed. If you are running on Mac, also, um, you need to make sure Xcode is properly set up and installed. 
Um, emulators are important. Uh, for this case, I'm going to use Android. So then I need to also install Android. But you can also go ahead and use iOS simulator. No problem. You can also run your app on a physical devices. No problem. Uh, one thing, important thing that you need to know when it comes to Flutter is Flutter has four channels. Master, Dev, Beta, Stable. And that gives you uh, the different level of features. Uh, so Stable is the one perhaps you want to get started with, but there are some features that are not available in Stable and they are for testing or they has been released recently. So like Beta, for instance, if you want to use web version of the Flutter, that you need to go ahead and use it for Beta. So the dev channel uh, also uh, has uh, more feature that is not available in beta and stable and same for master, which is the most up to date one gets all the commits there. But not necessarily the most stable one. So simply create your app by just running a command and make sure you always have the latest SDK on the channel that you want. And that's it. And there is also a command uh, for uh, Flutter CLI, which is Flutter uh, Doctor, which helps you to, to realize what kind of problem you have in your machine and gives you some suggestion. Once you're done, then your project is uh, created. You can go ahead to your project and take a look at the structure. The structure is fairly simple. So you have Android, iOS, which this is our main point of talk. So if you go for web and uh, other uh, different channels, you need to enable them by a uh, flag and then you will have more folders for different platforms. But at this point, we're just going to talk about Android and iOS, which is the default one for Flutter Stable when you create them. So the Android folder, perhaps uh, we can just leave it. We don't necessarily need to do anything when we want to run for the first time. And the iOS similar, it just there for doing some stuff for iOS compiling iOS app. And here is the main library where the most important, most important part of your uh, development journey, let's say it uh, starts from here. Everything is uh, in a Dart file from here. You write your Dart code from this point and you start your scaffolding your project under leap folder. And of course you need to use a dependency uh, <coughs> management which is a pop.dev in flood and uh, dart so pop spec is uh, where you define your uh, dependencies and requirements for your app we're going to look at that in the next slide quickly so and last but not least test folder where you write your test we have uh, three different type of test in flutter uh, unit test widget tests and integration so you write them under this folder one important thing for test is that the, the test files need to have underscore test. So then Flutter can detect this is a test file. Um, the pub.spec.yaml file, well, similar to perhaps any languages that you are using for dependency. So you, you have dependency. This is a YAML file, so pretty familiar perhaps. Uh, dependency, you define your packages, your versioning, and <coughs> you go ahead and by running Flutter pub get, download all of them and, and you can start using them in your project. Same goes for the dev dependencies, which requires you to do something during the development. And at the end of the day, Flutter can work with, uh, of course, um, uh, your desired uh, editor. So if you are in a, a VS Code or IntelliJ or an Android Studio user, don't worry, you are, you are covered. So you have, you just need to install plugins uh, for Flutter and Dart and go ahead and start using the application. Let's get started now the fun part. It was just... Uh... Hi, Majid. Yes? yes. I just wanted to remind you is there 10 minutes left before the end of your presentation? Absolutely. Then it's enough for building an app. Great. More than enough. Um, all right. Let me just uh, quickly do that. All right. Um, <clears throat> here you go. Let's go to 
next uh, slide and next uh, <clears throat> step so uh, as I told you I already scaffolded the flutter uh, project so here you go this is the project what I'm gonna do for you is let's have a look at another app this is an app a simple app like perhaps you see it in most of the apps you you play with so there's a login page and then maybe you want to log in and log out we want to see like how quickly we can uh, like create this right now so I'll show you like in maybe less than 10 minutes we will create this screen and we will also create that one as simple as this let's move on and create that quickly first of all because this is a scaffold project I just need to clean it up a little bit let's clean it up quickly I want to just remove all of the uh, comments first because it's just irrelevant uh, I don't want them very quick uh, let's do that once I am done with that uh, these are all the comments good and one more uh, good uh, feature or one of the most favorite feature in Flutter development is hot reloading and you you can feel it right now when I'm doing that let's have a look at uh, an example so you look at the header here it says Flutter demo homepage good but when I actually remove home page and hit the save button, it will immediately appear over there. And that is a fantastic feature, which you're going to love it when you're going to work with Flutter. So and it increase or boost your productivity significantly. Let's move on and uh, do something fun here. So the first widget that I have is just a my app widget and it accepts a title as you see it's a name parameter and that's the title for this header. All right, let's move on. What I don't want to do, I don't want a center widget here to show this stuff. I'm just gonna go ahead and first of all, remove this floating button. This is the floating button here. Just gonna remove that first and I'm gonna also remove center uh, but, uh, here and go ahead and do a column maybe for now and the uh, column gets a children that's very good so it's gonna be nothing here but the first thing that I saw in the app was a picture on top let's do a picture on top then so what I can do here is I first of all I need to uh, tell Flutter that there is a picture so I just want to show a picture over there that's good so here is my folder structure there is already an asset folder which I created and this is a picture that I added here and in PubSpec YAML file uh, under the Flutter I told the Flutter that there will be I want this picture, I want to tell Flutter that I want this picture to be inside my bundle. So then what I'm going to do here, I'm just going to go ahead and uh, here, there is an example here already, just going to grab that, say assets, and here is the assets, and I say the, the asset is just, uh, let's say, die month. And that's actually a PNG file. All right. So now, then this uh, picture will be loaded to the app. That's fine. The first thing that I needed to do. A second thing now, now I had to move on here and load this picture. But how can I do that? There is a widget already in um, <coughs> in uh, Flutter uh, that you can use for loading a picture. And that's going to be uh, image. So what are you going to do? You're just going to load a picture, right? And an image. So what do you need? <laughs> you just need an image. You just go ahead and say image. And depends on what type of image you want to load from asset, file, memory, network. You know, you may have HTTP, you know, image. So you choose one of these uh, factories so a constructor so for instance I want to load an asset and I just want to give uh, an asset uh, a URL that's gonna be loaded so it's gonna be under assets and it's gonna be diamond.png so very good my picture is now it's there the only thing is that it's not centered all right it's fine 
I can actually use and wrap my widget column with the center column, for instance. That's not the only way, by the way, and it will be center. So let's let's keep on this one, which is for now is easy. I just want to introduce you more, more and more widget, not the features on the each widget. So let's let's stick on that. There are different ways to do that, though. And another thing is that there will be a little bit of space, perhaps. There is a widget called sized box, which accepts a height. And you can say how much you want to go down. And you say, mm, maybe 30. And there will be a space. And if you saw in, uh, in already in, in the, another design, here, there was two text, uh, text file. Fantastic. So I'm going to go ahead and create two text files. So, and what I'm going to do here, go ahead and say text. Uh, I'm saying that this is a text uh, uh, input box, right? Text field. So perhaps there might be a widget for that. And there is. You're, you're guessing correct. So it's going to be a text field. And that's the one that gives you a text field. And it's coming here, you see already. But it's not the way that I want it, actually. What I want is... Uh, to uh, have uh, a border and maybe um, a placeholder. So I'm, this is the way that you can, this is one of the way that you can uh, modify each widget to, uh, to uh, match your design. There is, for instance, on this widget, there is a decoration which you can pass an input decoration class which will accept several things. And one of the things that I need here is a label text where I can say, um, OK, I just want to show a username. Here we go. So another thing is that I don't want this to be like material with no border. I want a border. Maybe I can use field and say through. And here we go. That's now field. At least I have a, like a background here. That is fantastic. So that's enough for me for now. OK, let's move on and create another one. So as you see here, I made a column because all of these as widgets like this one, uh, size box, text field, and another text field, they are coming like, you know, next after each other. So that's why I needed a column. You're just thinking logically a little bit here. Go ahead and do another one, text field. And all right, the text field probably comes right after that. Fantastic. I also need to do the same decoration, input decoration. And when you have installed uh, all of these uh, uh, plugins for your editor, your editor will help you to find this widget even easier. So now I'm going to have uh, this one. Let me also copy and paste this maybe and put it here and say this is password. There is one problem though here. When I have a password, it's not secure. I just want to tell to uh, that it's, this one must be secure. So I'm going to go ahead and say uh, this must be obscure text and the value is true. So go ahead and check it out. Now it's going to be a password. There is a little problem between two text box. Okay, what's the problem? The problem is that there is no space between them. Well, th one of the things that I can do is, because you learned right now, I can just copy this between this text field and the other one, put the box uh, size box here with a height, and that's going to be there. There is a problem here. So now I see like a problem of overflow. How can I fix that? There are several ways to fix that. Let's just stick on the one of the simplest one. I can maybe create and wrap all of my widget because that needs to be scrollable. Now it's not. It's just fixed, right? I need to wrap my, all of my widget with another widget that can make this scrollable. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap it with single, maybe child scroll view. And that's going to go ahead and give me this nice little uh, app so far. All right. Uh, seems like someone is here. I don't have time. Yes, Majid, we are running out of time. So okay. if you could end as soon as possible, yes. it would be great. Sure. <laughs> yeah, sure, absolutely. Uh, I thought we have 40 minutes. But anyway, yes, good. Um, uh, so. 
but you see at least in in like maybe five minutes <laughs> i was just live coding uh i created uh like two two input box everything is there everything is handled automatically i loaded the picture just in a very few moments so you can continue and you you need to know like this is a uh, very easy to, to continue working with like you know to just uh, grab your widget add it there and boom it's gonna be there and the most important thing is you got the feeling of hot reloading when i'm saying it's the more probably the best and most favorite feature in flutter for me it's just this hot reloading um reach me out later if you have any question uh thank you very much so for sure uh you can grab uh, these slides uh, on this URL and you can grab uh, the codes for both a login page and uh, the other one. Go ahead and clone it and reach me out, open an issue. If you have any problem, I'm happy to help for sure. Thank you so much, Majid. Thank you for your amazing speech. I can see uh, by the comments that you actually made people think that Flutter is easy, which is definitely good. Absolutely, I that think... was my goal. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think we'll see you a bit later on our group Q&A session. Sure. Which will be after our next two speakers will do their performance. So thank you so much again and we'll see you later. Thank you. See ya. Bye. Okay, guys, I hope everyone enjoyed this session as much as I did. And we are already ready to welcome our next speaker. It will be Thomas Buchert. Thomas, hi. Hi. So, Great Thomas to is a yes, glad to meet you and nice to see you again. <laughs> so, Thomas is a fluent Flutter developer, been almost 30 years in this industry, led him to a lot of different technologies like C++ with MFC, C Sharp, micro microcontrollers in C, and currently mobile app development with Flutter and Dart. What only few people know is that Thomas is a professional magician and he also bakes his own bread. So welcome, Thomas. I hope you are in a great mood. And I think you're going to present some magic for us. Yeah, more or less. <laughs> some code magic. Yeah. Um, welcome. I'm really happy to be there. And I want to talk with you about Rx Start. And um, I know a lot of, um, uh, of, of beginners. And uh, they somehow yeah, they uh, they are scared about this big with Rx, uh, Rx extensions. And that's why I tried to make uh, an, uh, a talk which, um, uh, yeah, which makes it easy because we try to tame the beast. And um, uh, we begin, um, before we really go to, you know, onto Rx, I, uh, we have to see what actually is a stream. And uh, you can imagine it a little bit like this here, that uh, we have a um, um, conveyor belt where on the one side, I put a data packet on. And uh, from there on, I don't have to care about it. It will be transported somewhere else. And the, uh, the, class, the uh, classes that I use to put something on a stream is uh, a stream controller or how it, it's called in uh, in Rx start a subject. So uh, this alone is not really interesting because uh, the packet just vanishes it. So um, we do something uh, that makes it a little bit more interesting. We uh, install sort of a trap on uh, the other side, and uh, as soon as the uh, as the um, packet reaches our trap. Uh, some something is triggered, so we can um, uh, we can we, we can uh, we can trigger and, uh, some function some some functionality with it. And the nice thing uh, about this is that uh, this part here and this part here can be in completely different parts of your app, and um, this gives you a lot of flexibility. So let's see how this looks in code. Um, we have seen we need a, a controller to uh, to pass uh, our data onto a stream. 
And um, to uh, set up the trap, uh, we use the listen fun function of a stream. And listen gets um, expects as parameter a function that gets passed in the latest value that just arrived on the stream. So um, doing it like this should print out later every time the uh, the item when it's uh, when it arrives. So now we start with adding items one, two, three, and we print in between um, another uh, another number and at the end. So um, now you, uh, you might wonder, this is one of the things that, that most people have a little bit uh, a problem in beginning with streams, um, that you always, um, yeah, you always write the part of code that reacts to the stream before you add items. This feels a little bit contraintuitive, like it normally is, but the thing is that actually this above here does only prepare this function uh, that it will be called. So it's not executed here. So um, we, if, when we do this here, and we and we will see that we will get this output here. Why is this so? Um, it is because uh, streams work asynchronous. And uh, this means that uh, I put uh, them all in, in, in this, uh, uh, here I put them all onto the stream controller, but uh, the listen function has no chance to react yet because um, I did not uh, uh, give a, a wait or give a, a wait a little bit, a moment of time. I do this only down here. So that's the reason why you get them in this sequence, which might not be expected. Also something special. So um, to, uh, to make streams really work, you always have to, uh, uh, to do them in a context where um, in between uh, you give the stream time to react. Typically this happens uh, while, um, while you wait for the next, while the, ne uh, the, while the, the next frame is, uh, is coming, then uh, there's always a, a little bit of time that, uh, that you can uh, react. So um, I can um, also, uh, this is something that we have, uh, have ignored here, listen um, in reality returns um, a value, it's called a subscription. A subscription um, is more or less um, a handle that, less, uh, that um, gives us control over this function here. Especially it gives us control to, um, to cancel uh, this, uh, uh, this subscription so that it's no longer executed. Yeah? So in this time, this time, we also, we add three, uh, three items. We give the stream a, a moment to react. We cancel the subscription. We add an, another item and, and wait again. So um, you can't uh, always think this is what we, what we get. Because, um, uh, be, uh, because after the cancel, we add it here, but this function here does no longer react on it. This is something it's a little bit uh, a detail, but it's important to know. Um, the default for Dart streams is a uh, single subscription. Uh, I never understood why they did this, um, because it means that only one party can listen to the stream. So uh, not multiple, you cannot uh, listen from multiple places in your app to the same stream, uh, which might, might be handy, for example, if uh, I use the stream to, uh, uh, to publish error messages. And it could be that I uh, want to uh, to show um, on my UI, I want to show an error text, and at the same time, an another place I want to uh, um, to make some uh, some um, uh, some signal uh, changing the color in this moment. <clears throat> so um, this is important. Um, but if you use a broadcast stream, you don't have this limitation. So uh, typically, if you are not sure what to use, use a broadcast stream. 
it's uh, it's easy. You you only need to use the name constructor broadcast, or you have you can control an existing stream to a broadcast stream um, this way. So um, the, everything else keeps the same. We just listen to uh, uh, also to the broadcast stream, and uh, if multiple uh, uh, if multiple listeners listen on one broadcast stream, they all get uh, notified as soon as a new element arrives. So streams have some nice features. Um, first of all, they are type safe. You only can put one type of object on a stream or a subtype or, 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 um, or subtypes of this type, but not um, any type. Streams are asynchronous. Uh, which can be really, uh, really nice if we um, have um, some asynchronous operation and uh, we expect to the result later, we can use a stream to decouple this, for example. And um, this is also a nice thing. Um, you can make a stream construction everywhere, also in the, in the constructor, where, uh, uh, where you only could, um, uh, could fire, uh, you, you could only call an async function as a fire and forget because you can't await such a function. But you can define the screen, uh, stream subscription in the constructor of your class um, that defines what the, how this stream will be handled. We can transform any async function to a stream. So uh, if I have such an async, async function, I can just call on the, because this returns the future, and future has the method as stream, and I can listen to it. And in many uh, situations, this can be much more, uh, yeah, uh, gives you much more possibilities as we will see later. And it, if you got to use to, to read streams from the left to the right, uh, you see it's, it's quite easy to understand what happens there. So if we compare, ah, I think it's we, we see it late, later on. Okay. Now, where does Rx start fit in? So, um, Rx was uh, developed by Microsoft in 2010, so it's pretty old. And uh, interestingly, it uh, it uh, it wasn't really much uh, picked up uh, by um, .NET developers at this time. But uh, in other communities, it was very, very uh, uh, much appreciated, Java and, and, and JavaScript. And you could imagine, yeah, it's the streams of, on steroids because you get a lot of mo lot more stream processing functions with Rx. And uh, what's a little bit special that um, as Dart includes streams as part of the language, the Rx Dart implementation did not do a completely new implementation like other platforms, they uh, based it on the uh, on Dart streams underneath. Yeah, there's some little one a little difference. Um, uh, stream controllers are called subjects in Rx, um, but also subjects have a little have some um, some nice. Uh, nice features, or it's a little bit different, because uh, subjects are uh, uh, broadcast by default. And also, um, if you want to listen, um, uh, and also you don't have um, to call um, stream controller, uh, you don't have to access the stream or the sync um, with, the, uh, with the property, just talk, take the subject. And we have different types of subject. Uh, we have um, the published subject that's uh, and uh, that's just normal as if, if you would listen, and the behavior subject, which is actually the one that uh, is probably mostly used, it stores the last received value. What does this mean? Um, it means that if uh, I subscribe to, an, uh, if I start to listen, which is called subscribing, um, if I start to listen on behavior subject, and this uh, subject has already received some elements before, my new subscription will immediately get the last received value and uh, it gets executed. So um, this is uh, especially for, um, for updating your UI, it's a, it's a very, nice, uh, uh, very nice option to use in behavior subject because 
with a um, published subject, you would need to wait for the next um, element that arrives before you can display something. And um, also in the past or in other Rx implementations, uh, streams are not called streams, but they are called observables. This was not so long ago, this was the same uh, in Rx start, but since we got um, extension methods, we now can just use standard streams uh, with the Rx extension methods. So data processing on the fly. Yeah, this is uh, one of the great stuff that we can do with streams and Rx, which means uh, we can uh, put some processing element in the middle of the stream and uh, automatically our, um, our data that is put on one side will uh, appear on the other side in a modified state. And the, um, the easiest uh, version for this is uh, the map extension function. Uh, we see here, we have, um, we, have, we have our subject. We already set up the, the handler, what it should do. It should map, then you get uh, give it a, a function, what it should be done with this, uh, with every item, and we listen to it. And uh, then when we add this, uh, uh, this strings, we will receive them in uppercase. Map is an extremely, is, you might have used map uh, in context with, uh, with lists before. It's the same, the same principle, but for streams. Or for example, something like this. If I have, um, I, I, I have some, um, uh, some data class and I need this in another form uh, to, um, that, that's, that I can easier display it. Or for example, I, the input is a raw um, JSON, uh, JSON uh, map, and I want to have real objects on the other side. I also can use map in this way. This is what we, uh, what we actually have here. So um, what I've uh, done here is I define, I have a class user uh, and I have a uh, factory function from JSON, which is in this case uh, manually, but uh, um, you can um, better create, uh, use some uh, serializer package that uh, in, in a real project. And um, uh, we imagine, eventually we have an, an um, async um, rest RP call that will return us uh, users in uh, as a list of uh, of JSON strings. So uh, what we uh, what we can do is we have the ASM call, we convert it to a stream, and we map. In this case, we um, we define what is our um, uh, our target type. We want to want to get a user from this, and we call uh, 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 from from JSON and listen to it and uh, in the end we can print out what we uh, uh, what we received so um, map is an extremely powerful uh, uh, um, tool uh, to have stream yeah uh, we have already said before we can uh, convert every um, async call uh, into a stream and um, yeah uh, if you got once used to read this, this way, um, at least in my opinion, it is uh, easier uh, to read um, than on a, on a short glance that I say, okay, I have a stream, map this, then um, the same thing um, use, uh, by using um, an iterative approach uh, with a weight. So why do we talk about this? Um, yeah, stream. Uh, Flutter has an, a very, very nice uh, widget. It's called the Stream Builder widget. And uh, a Stream Builder gets updated every time the stream that you pass in gets a new value. So, um, for example, here, of my stream, I access over an, uh, over an uh, inherit, uh, inherited uh, widget. I access my, um, my, 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 my business logic, my, my models. And this model has a stream that is called new weather events. 
and this I pass in to stream uh, as uh, as parameter. Up here, I define, I give it a type, what sort of data uh, will I expect? And then I have to pass in a builder that got, gets called every time we receive a new, a new value. And um, this is, uh, we return a snapshot and because it's an async process. So we have to check, uh, has it data um, on, and um, that's our data has, the, has is something, it does it have a length bigger than zero, for example. And um, then I can return a list builder, which uh, directly uh, creates my, uh, my list, uh, list on the, on, on the, uh, on, um, on the UI uh, based on the uh, data on, of the weather entry. And in this call, I don't show what build, build row will do some nice, um, some some light and some nice list element element in the list view. And if we have no data, we just um, show, for example, here um, no items. So one of the things that uh, that we have regularly uh, is that um, uh, we have some some search field, for example, that uh, and we want uh, as soon as the search field is uh, changes the input that. Um, that our uh, display gets updated, for example, from a rem remote server. Now, if we would do a REST call on every key press, this uh, could uh, yeah uh, could be a little bit too much for a server if a ma if many people do uh, would do this. So it makes much more sense uh, to wait till the user uh, makes a short pause after he inputs some 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 pieces. That uh, that he makes a short short pause, and only then do the uh, do the call. And this is very easy to do with uh, with Rx. We need for this we uh, we use uh, two subjects, an input input subject and a result subject, and um, we publish the result subject uh, by uh, by by publishing. Only the stream interface of the of the of the subject, um, so that from the outside it's just a stream, and um, we use uh, this this handler function on search text change in our text field on the UI. Yeah. So the, so the idea is, whenever the text changes in the UI, we will um, put the new text value into our input subject. And what we do here in the constructor is that we define a rule what happens with data on the input subject. In this case, we call the debounce method. Debounce does exactly what we what we want. It only will let down let, let through a data package if uh, there has been um, if, if this value has been constant for a certain time. Yeah. And uh, so uh, only then we do the uh, the debounce. Then we call another Rx function async map. It's like a, like like map, but in this call uh, in, in this case uh, it allows us to call an async function. For example, here we can directly call from in here the uh, our our REST API call. And in the listen, we uh, uh, we add the result that we get back to the result subject. So, and in the UI, our, uh, some uh, stream builder will uh, will uh, will listen to the result subject to get updated. And this is it's very descriptive and, uh, and easy to read what is going on. Yeah, if I would do this um, with loops, before uh, uh, for loops or something like this, everything would look much more complicated. Another example, merging data. Um, let's imagine we, uh, we we write some social media uh, um, application, which gets uh, gets uh, posts from Twitter and from Facebook, and we want to uh, show all in one stream in the UI. So, um, what are we doing? We um, 
uh, we do um, we have for uh, get Twitter stream returns a stream from Twitter and get Facebook stream from Facebook. Um, we map in both cases the uh, the data uh, and we assign the result, which is still a stream. Yeah, this is this is it's not not an element, which is still a stream to uh, to a temporary variable. Does we do the same with Facebook stream? And then we can, can call um, merge with, which allows to merge um, a list of other streams together with, uh, with this stream into one resulting stream. And it behaves exactly like uh, what you see up here in the, uh, in the animation, which means the, uh, the, the items are merged uh, the way they come in. So um, there's... Uh, it's uh, it's the sequence is not uh, not defined that you uh, that you get them out. But for an for, for an application like this here, it's exact. It's absolutely fine. Let's see some uh, an, an, another case. Uh, if um, if you have used uh, uh, Firestore before, you know that Firestore uh, offers uh, updates to its collections as streams. Now imagine we have a UI that uh, should display uh, news and weather e next to each other. And uh, it sh should be should update whenever either news collection changes or weather collection change. So um, in this case, there is another pretty good function that we can use an extension, extension function. It's called combine latest. Combined latest wait till it gets from both sides at least one element, and then returns from from then on always uh, returns uh, the currently received one together with the last value from the other side. Yeah, this is also uh, very nice if you want to um, merge. Uh, se uh, several streams that could re uh, uh, where you could get um, error messages to it that so that you uh, it, it, that you have always the um, the combined uh, the, uh, the, the combined state of every uh, error uh, stream in one object, but uh, it only uh, but it updates every time uh, one of them changes. Let's see how this looks in um, in code. It's a little bit more in this case. I hope it's big enough to see. Uh, I think it's it's, it's okay. Um, we have uh, the uh, we define an, a, a class weather entry, very um, uh, very simple. Also a news in entry, uh, very simple. Uh, I don't have uh, implemented the the actual mapping from from it, Jason, but um, this would be done here. And we uh, need a class news aggregator, which is the combined uh, value of the uh, what we get on um, uh, from the uh, weather entries um, collection and from the news entry collection. So this is uh, this is this what we get over here. And then oh, this is I forget to update this one. This should be today a stream, not an observable. So um, we have in this case uh, a property, observable news uh, uh, stream news aggregator, and this is news weather, which is one uh, one stream. Combine latest, then we uh, we we add um, one snapshot of the um, of uh, the uh, of, of Firestore. And the other uh, snapshot, and uh, as a result, we have to uh, to pass the uh, the actually the aggregator from um, uh, that makes from the that creates a new value, and this is in this case the last parameter, which is uh, just a function that uh, that gets the latest value of both snapshots, and we return a combined value. Um, as, in, as uh, news, uh, the news aggregate, uh, aggregator object. So combine latest uh, is a very very nice uh, nice opportunity. 
Oh, I'm pretty fast today. That's fine. Um, yeah, there are screams. Uh, they are very. It's a very concise way to uh, to express uh, what you want. Um, it's an, um, it's almost uh, declarative. Uh, what uh, that you describe uh, what will happen to your data. Uh, it's absolutely to to take um, value uh, from uh, uh, for, uh, from Rx. You don't have to be an, an Rx wizard. You can start with some basic operators like that. What we have seen: map, combine, latest, and then with time you can um, start uh, adding more uh, operators uh, to your tool belt because uh, Rx has really, really a lot of different functions, yeah? Um, but this is really something uh, you can uh, evolve slowly. Then um, streams of the stream builder, yeah, it actually, it, it matches the, uh, the reactive model because uh, uh, the moment some, some object is received, we update our UI. And um, uh, to the outlook, what's uh, quite nice is, um, Besides uh, Rx on streams, there is also now a package uh, from me, which is called Functional Listener, which actually offers um, uh, similar uh, extension methods like Rx, but uh, for value listenables instead for streams. So um, if you uh, mainly are interested in this um, functions for combination and you don't want to get into streams, um, you can, uh, Similarly, now we use this with value listenables. Yeah, I have an, um, two blog, blog posts uh, which actually cover more or less what we have heard today in the uh, on this talk, and uh, these two are really the, the sources where you can um, go as deep as, as you want uh, into the Rx uh, rabbit hole. Yeah, we have a little bit of time. So uh, if you have any questions, I'm going to go back up. Yes, hi, Thomas. I see that hi. there are some questions in the stream. So let's see the first of them, and it will be this one. Is Rx structure similar to notify a listener concept in Swift? Mm, there I have the problem that I'm not uh, I'm I'm not familiar with the notify listener concept in Swift, but it sounds like it. Um, I don't know if um, uh, yeah uh, the idea is it, it, probably it has the same uh, same concept for, uh, but maybe notify listener is more like the valued listen uh, listenable. I don't know if uh, notify listen a listener is asynchronous, for example. Um, but uh, yeah, I guess it's, it's similar. Okay, thank you. And I think we have time for one more question. Oh, we have, we have I it think we have eight minutes left. Yes. Or five minutes. Hmm? Five minutes left. Oh. Yes, should here's it, the next questions. Should it be in async map? I think it's related to some part of your code. Yeah, 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 yeah. I am. Uh, um, I, am I, I see yeah. the continuation of this question. It's this probably. This is the the asset map that was um, here. Um, nope, it was not. I think map. Oh yeah, right, right. It should be an error. Yep, yep, yep. You caught an uh, you 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 caught uh, caught a typo. Yep. Also here. I'm actually. Oh, <laughs> oh no! I, I know what, how this happened. Uh, I was um, updating uh, this because there was also still an observable in this, and I had only the images, so I did an OCR over the images. And put it back into uh, into the editor, and the OCR swallowed the uh, the arrows. That's the reason. Okay. 
Okay, it's completely fine. <laughs> See what can happen actually. Okay, so actually we have one more question and I think it would be really nice to ask this question again when there will be a Q&A session where okay. all of our speakers can actually answer this question and share their thoughts. It's actually the, I think the quite common question is comparison between Flutter and React Native. If you would like, you can share a few details about it right now as we mm -hmm. still have a few minutes till the end of uh, your speech. And then we'll continue this discussion of, in our Q&A panel. Okay. Um, yeah, I think it, it has several advantages. Um, one of the things is uh, it uses Start and not JavaScript. Many people might might look at this as a disadvantage. I think it's an advantage because Dart is a strongly typed language that gives you uh, a lot of security when you are working with it. Also, um, as uh, performance-wise, uh, Flutter uh, will be uh, much faster, especially if you are rendering complex graphics because um, Flutter's uh, rendering engine uh, directly draws on a canvas using OpenGL. And uh, instead of uh, React Native, which maps to um, uh, to the native controls, so uh, there uh, it will definitely have an advantage. From the the model, the base model, uh, how you build an app, uh, it's it's quite similar. And um, so it really depends if you are uh, very very comfortable with, with uh, JavaScript and uh, then uh, probably React is, uh, is, uh, will be easier to start with. But um, if you want uh, something, uh, uh, if, you, if you want to go onto Flutter, you get also the advantages that uh, Flutter is available. Uh, Flutter apps can run on Windows, Linux, and Mac OS. Even on some embedded devices, uh, uh, Flutter was ported. Um, and uh, so currently, um, it's my my opinion is uh, if you really want to go cross platform uh, flutter is the way to go okay thank you thomas thank you for your speech it was really amazing and thank you for all the valuable information that you shared with us we'll see you again in our q a session and i know that that today this is your second talk you already uh, performed on our senior track so thank you for that again and mm -hmm. we'll see you right after our next talk. So it will be in 40 minutes. Great. So I'm not saying bye to you. So see you later. Yeah, see you. OK, guys, I hope you enjoyed this talk. And we are already ready to welcome our next speaker, who is uh, Remy Ruslet. How? Hi, Remy. How are you doing today? Hi. Uh, yes, we can hear you now. <laughs> oh, okay, you. so, yeah, great. Remy is deeply in love with Flutter and he spends a lot of time exchanging with the Flutterverse. He stands out as the author of provider Flutterhooks or his contributions Stack Overflow. Rami is going to tell us today about managing the state of Flutter application using Riverprod. As far as understood, Riverprod is your own creation. Am I right? Yeah. Yeah, it's a kind of a reinvention of another creation of my uh, provider. So, um, yeah. Oh, that's amazing. I'm sure uh, your speech is going to be interesting. And we are already excited to hear a lot of valuable and interesting information from you. So, Remy, <laughs> the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Oh, let me share my screen. Okay. Yes, we can see your screen for the moment. Yes, sure. Okay. Great, you can start now. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, today um, I'm going to talk about Europa, 
Um, so as as uh, was mentioned before, um, I'm Remy. I'm the, the author of uh, Provider, which you likely heard about if you used Flutter before. It's a relatively popular uh, state management library uh, for Flutter. And so Riverbot is kind of um, a follow-up to, to Provider. Uh, it tries to fix some issues with Provider, and, uh, and we'll explain that um, in more detail. So uh, Riverbot. Um, before starting exactly directly with Riverbot, I want to kind of explain why I make a new package and also kind of why we want a package to begin with, because technically we can maintain state in Flare without using package too. So it's important to understand why we want a package and what, uh, what are we trying to do with this uh, to not just add dependencies for no reason. So uh, let's start you know, with the different approaches. Um, so, um, a starter would be why not using global for the point in, in Flare. You, you could technically not use any state rule widget, not use any state management library, and just start with uh, a plain value notifier, for example, in, in Flare, and define it as a global variable, uh, as uh, shown here. And then you could technically you know, create a stateless widget. And inside your stateless widget, you could use a value listener or builder to listen to your value notifier which would cause your UI to reveal whenever the global state is modified. Um, that's a, like, a very simple way of listening to your state. So you pass the value here and, listen, and uh, build some UI from the um, value. And then you inside, you could have a button that increments the state. Um, yeah. It's a very simple, simple approach to, to maintain state. Um, so yeah, it's straightforward. And uh, one of the other benefits uh, is by using value listenable builder, uh, we are rebuilding only what is necessary when the UI renders, uh, when, when the state changes. And we're not rebuilding every single widget of the application, which is, which is good for performance. Uh, so you may be wondering why we don't do that. Um, the um, one of the reasons would be that the stability, um, because you know uh, when you want to write tests, um, you will have uh, since your state is global, uh, your state will be persisted between tests, which means that if if one test increments the counter, for example, uh, then the other tests. Um, will not have the default value of the counter. It will start from the previous value. So you need to have this mechanism, um, and which, we, which we call tear off um, when making tests to kind of, between tests, reset the entire state of the application, which can be very complex. And it's very easy to to do badly and have some Fail to spot fail to spot issues with your test and potentially have regressions without um, actually seeing them. So that's not a good thing. Um, another thing would be that uh, by doing this, we don't really have any any very specific place to endorse the business logic, as we would call it in um, Flare. The logic is kind of all over the place. It's one button will update this, uh, this state, another widget will update the state, and it's not very structured. So as your application scale, um, you will definitely have some issues with um, maintaining all the logic considering it's very difficult to, to learn and, and, and everything that comes with it. Um, also, one of the things I don't quite like is uh, we are using value listenable builder here, which is necessary to uh, make the UI update when the state update. But if you want to, if, if you use these builders, and especially if you want to, to listen to multiple states at the same time, uh, this suddenly um, decreases readability because it uh, increments the tabulation in your, um, in your file. 
uh, you can easily add, uh, you can easily have um, a few, a few, uh, a few indentations for no reason. And it, it, it also adds some noise about around um, what the UI is actually trying to render. Um, so it's, it's less obvious what the widget does. Uh, it's also quite low level. Uh, which means that if you want to do some more advanced things like maybe logging or uh, if you want to debug your application using the dev tool, uh, chances are that you will have to do a lot of stuff manually. For example, you will not see your state of your global variables inside the Flutter dev tool. You will have to manually expose them if you wanted to. Um, so uh, there's a lot of work to do that you probably won't do and uh, that will make your journey harder. Um, so, it's, so why it's very simple to, to get started with, um, it's, um, you can easily struggle with it on the long run. Um, then the, the other approach would be set for widget with player. So you know, uh, you create a set for, you create a set for widget, you um, specify your count variable, and um, then you do um, on click. You, you call set state to update the state, which would which would cause uh, the widget to reveal and uh, render the UI. But more realistically, um, the the UI as the widgets are not exactly this way. Uh, like here, this example showcases uh, such widget tree where uh, the count uh, the count variable is used only in the home page, but in real applications will likely have more than one page. And for example, here, if we had a home page and a dashboard, and the dashboard wants to access the count, then it counts because the count is stored inside home. So, we're not, so we don't have access to the variable, uh, which means that if we want to access it in the in dashboard, uh, we somehow have to refactor the application to uh, move the count some, in some place where dashboard can suddenly access it which we call leaves the state up in Flutter. So basically, we move count, maybe in my app, which is a root widget of our application, and, pass, and my app will pass it down to dashboard, which looks more like this. Uh, so uh, now it's our entire application that's over the counter, and that then pass it to home, and uh, home re receives the current count as parameter and, and receives this unchanged callback fields on increment to update the state. That's fine, but it makes refactoring quite painful um, because you know every, uh, every time you want to, every time new widgets want to access the state, you have to move uh, the state between many different widgets. And if you potentially add um, multiple levels of, if maybe a very deep widget wanted to access the counter and not just this, the home, but maybe a sub widget of home, you would have to pass the counter from home to the sub widgets and over and over and over again. It can be quite tedious to do. And another downside would be, um, yeah, another downside would be um, mm -hmm. that it's rebuilding the entire um, widget when you're updating the state. Like before, with the global variable, it would be a rebuild only the text when the state of that. Whereas here, when the counter updates, it reveals all the pages at the same time. So it reveals both home and the dashboard and potentially all the pages, which is not good for performance. So yeah, as I mentioned, um, one of the benefits of this approach, though, is that it's testable because we are not relying on the global state anymore. So uh, we can test in isolation between tests. We're not sharing state between tests. So we don't have to make uh, any tear up whatsoever or anything. Um, the logic is in one space, is in one specific space, uh, play, uh, yeah, in one specific place inside your state for widget. All of your logic is usually inside your state for widget. So it's great for discovery and, and making these things over time. Um, and it's also uh, implementing advanced features like, you know, implicit animations, implicit data fetching. But the dungeons are, are the same as I mentioned before. Um, you have to pass the state manually between widgets, can be tedious to refactor and can work on many widgets to reveal. Um, and it's still relatively low level. Um, you still have to do a lot of things manually. 
Um, so that's where um, in our we just um, are useful in Flutter. You know, that widgets are a way to kind of solve these issues with stateful widgets without relying on global variables. And more specifically, um, you, you may not be familiar with inherited widgets um, nowadays, but um, you've already used provider, which is a um, super set of inherited widgets, which tries to simplify the API from inherited widgets. I won't do a comparison between provider and inherited widgets, but um, they're basically the same thing. So the difference here would be um, the, the widget tree, um, which slightly changed from before. In this situation, rather than storing this state inside Ma um, the Maya widget, we would add a new widget to the widget tree. And that new widget would um, handle the counter. So it would um, have all the business logic related to the counter and exclusively to the counter. And then uh, it would expose the counter to the uh, to all of its descendants, such that the home page and the dashboard can listen to it if they wanted to. And um, but that means that by using a provider, we don't have to pass the state of the counter to every single widget in the widget tree. Uh, descendants uh, of the provider in the widget tree can access providers um, without having to receive the provider from its, from, its, from its constructor. So it makes things a lot easier to, to obtain variables. You don't have to pass them over and over. So it's kind of like a shortcut around constructors. Um, so it would typically look like this. Um, you may create a chess specifier or Depending on the library you're using, maybe you're not creating a change notifier, but instead you're creating um, a state notifier, a qubit, a block, uh, whatever. And uh, then you have your business logic inside your um, your uh, class to handle, you know, incrementing the counter and whatever. And you have your um, widget, your UI that will. Um, this is the um, main application widget, which creates a change provider that then uh, pass an instance of the uh, class we saw previously. Um, and that was, this class would then be exposed to the application. And then we have our different routes, so the on page and everything, which will then be able to access the class we created. And finally, um, our different routes are now, now able to um, obtain the counter we created. So we can see here um, that um, the home uh, is able to uh, listen to um, the counter and, and it will be able to reveal when the counter changed with just calling context.watch counter. So it makes things easier. We don't have to make constructors anymore. Um, so um, one of the benefits is, you know, once again, we have uh, testability benefits. We have basically the same testability uh, than with um, stateful widgets. Um, we can uh, replace implementation of a provider inside tests with a different uh, implementation. So, so um, that's useful for mocking things. And uh, there's still no global state. So uh, no state is shared between tests. And the logic is centralized once again uh, inside this change to your class instead of uh, state for wooded. Um, so it's even more centralized than before um, because we're not mixing UI and business logic. The change to is just handling the logic and uh, your Maya project is um, just handling the routing. Um, it's also significantly easier to refactor um, because now if you want to move widgets, for example, if you want to extract, uh, split home into multiple widgets or extract um, 
extract some widget into set widget, whatever. Um, move things around. Um, you certainly don't have to um, pass things between, pass the state between many different widgets to achieve the same thing. You can just access um, your state from nearly any widget uh, in just a single line of code. So it makes things infinitely easier. Um, and it has also a relatively robust default behavior, um, especially if you're using provider. Uh, for example, by default, it will show you dev tool and it will make sure your state is not lost um, when somehow the provider reveals. Uh, it's able to cache uh, the state between reveals. Um, so first, many performance optimizations. Um, you're still able, with, by using unitary widgets, you're still able to like with global variables I mentioned previously, reveal only what changed. And you can actually filter more easily things slightly further than with just, you know, value listenable builder, um, with things like context stock select in provider that allows you to uh, listen to only a substate of uh, an object in rather than just the entire object. Um, and uh, it also remove uh, the requirement for nesting builders. So it makes the code more readable. We don't have these builders anymore that uh, add some noise on our UI. And yeah, if I mentioned this state is visible in the dev tool. So, so that's great and all. Um, I mean, many people have used provider. Uh, and it's probably one of the most popular uh, state management libraries uh, nowadays. It's definitely, um, doing what it's trying to, it's definitely doing uh, its job relatively well, at least um, from my understanding and from the feedback of the community. Um, so why am I making uh, another uh, approach, uh, you might ask? Um, well, my provider is great. Uh, there, are some, there are still some edge cases where it's not, um, it's not a sufficient, uh, I would say. Uh, for example, tests can still be quite verbose, especially if you want to um, if you want to mock mock things. Um, you will have to uh, reintroduce many providers uh, and reintroduce all the boilerplate about creating providers just to mock a single provider. You will have to introduce uh, all, almost all of, all of, all of uh, the providers inside your application, um, which is usually unnecessary, especially because you may want to test the providers. So if you have to copy paste their implementation, it's not necessarily a good thing. Um, also, um, providers usually have to always be above material app. So uh, we kind of lose the benefit of um, having providers disposing their state when um, the provider is destroyed because since they are always about material labs, this state is basically never destroyed, um, at least naturally. Um, so um, I've seen many people in the community trying to push providers um, as deep in the data tree as possible, like for example, inside the home page rather than above material lab. But that causes a lot of other issues, especially with routing. So. If, if you wanted to uh, share the state between the home page and the dashboard, um, it would require a, a, lo a lot of um, advanced logic around um, pushing the, dash uh, the dashboard around such that the dashboard should be able to access the provider. Um, so I definitely believe um, it's better to put the providers above material, but we're not able to clean resources um, as people would like to. Um, it can cause some runtime ex exceptions. It's actually one of the most common errors with providers. Uh, I, I, saw, I saw on Stack Overflow at least hundreds of questions about, uh, I got this provider not found exception. What can I do with this? What is happening? How can I, uh, how can I solve it? It's usually always the same thing. It's usually uh, people misusing uh, context as they're using the wrong context and take it an exception. But that's a niche issue that is unique to inherited widgets. Like if you use global variables or stateful widgets, you wouldn't have these runtime exceptions. And, and this runtime exceptions makes refactoring uh, harder 
innocent. Uh, so you might not be able to immediately see the uh, regressions inside your different widgets. Some widgets may still try to access a uh, provider that is currently unavailable, but you may not see it until you run the code. Um, similarly, um, combining state can be difficult, um, especially if you have some asynchronous state. Like if you want to load asynchronously the information of a user, um, then uh, um, providers um, don't necessarily on top of the fact that the incoming source does, that um, I mean, providers can listen to other providers, but if the other providers are asynchronous, it will be difficult to undo the loading state of these other providers. Um, yeah. And furthermore, uh, another difficult scenario would be showing models, uh, for example, with provider. Um, there is no built-in mechanism to handle um, um, reacting to a change on the provider uh, besides re-rendering uh, a widget. But I mean, in further, when we want to show models, we have to call this show dialog uh, method, uh, which must not be called directly inside the build method because you will get an exception. But um, with provider, you will have some difficulties around um, knowing when you can call this show dialog method. Um, you, um, yeah. So Riverbot is trying to um, fix these uh, limitations. Um, so these limitations are not really deal breakers in themselves, but fixing those would be better, uh, obviously. So uh, what is, uh, how does it work? Um, So let's get started. Yeah. So Riverpod is very similar in principle to, to provider. Uh, it's just slightly changing the syntax uh, to somehow fix uh, the different issues that I mentioned before. So first of all, if you want to use uh, Riverpod, you have to um, encapsulate your application into a widget named provider scope. It um, enables uh, Riverpod on your their project. You don't have to pass any specific argument or care about what it does. Just know that you need to insert it inside your widget tree and forget about it. Um, yeah. And make sure to insert it inside the main and not inside your my app widget if you have one. This way, during test, you can potentially replace this provider scope with something more specific. Uh, yeah. Then you may want to define some state. So there are actually multiple ways to define state in, in, in Riverpod. Riverpod is relatively flexible about what is a state. Um, but you can continue like you would typically do in provider. You can create your alternative here. You don't have to care about all the different providers that Riverpod expose. So yeah, just start with alternative here and don't really care uh, about all the different options available. It's probably the easiest one since you're likely familiar with it. And so you get uh, the same, um, you, you get the change of your provider that you, you will likely be used to if you use change of your, if you use provider before. Um, but the difference is that before in provider, uh, change of your provider was inserted inside the booted tree. Whereas here it's defined as a global, um, not really global variable, uh, it's more a global constant uh, since uh, the provider is immutable. Um, but uh, it's just, uh, this variable is just a way to interact with the provider, but we'll see that later. So yeah, the provider will create the instance of our counter class. Uh, and uh, yeah. And I would really want to, uh, insist on the fact that you should not be scared about the fact that uh, providers are declared as globals. Um, because while they are global, um, they don't really suffer from the drawbacks of global variables. So you should not worry about it too much. Uh, we'll talk about this uh, later. So then if you want to listen to the state of your provider, um, it's relatively straightforward, and 
you create a widget. Um, but note that um, it's slightly different from uh, other widgets. Here, rather than subclassing a stateless widget, we are going to subclass a consumer widget, uh, which is a widget provided by, um, by Riverpod to help you listen to providers. And so the only difference with stateless widget is that uh, the PM method receives one extra parameter, which is a watch function. So it receives both the context and this watch function. And then now you have now that you have created a consumer widget, you can um, use this watch method inside your build method to and you and you pass the providers that you want to listen to. Uh, and then uh, by calling a watch with the provider, um, the function will return um, the state exposed by the provider. So the instance of the class counter. And then you can naturally use it inside your uh, widget as you would normally do and I don't know, run your text and potentially call methods on it uh, when you click on a button. So once again, we don't need builders uh, here anymore. Uh, we can listen uh, to states linearly. Uh, there is no indentation involved. So as I mentioned previously, um, is um, we kind of have the simplicity of global variables uh, that's what, that were mentioned at the very beginning of the talk, but results that are downside. Um, so first of all, uh, we don't lose test ability. Uh, we can integrate with test tools. We, have, we, we can use, um, we have some middleware, so we can do some logging. Um, we don't really require, require nesting, which has, um, can easily combine states and advanced features uh, that we'll uh, talk about later. So for example, the DevTool integration. Um, if you open the Fire DevTool, you will see, uh, if you click on the provider scope widgets, you will be able to see the state of your different providers. Um, so uh, here we have a configuration provider that expose a configuration object, and mm -hmm. it's exposing what is inside this configuration object. Uh, yeah. And for example, if you wanted to combine providers, um, what you um, like first of all, if you have a, re, a re, repository class which does some data fetching, um, and then you will have a separate class that involves the business logic around um, an entity, then um, the class, the business logic class, will want to um, obtain the repository to to do some stuff. And so for this. Um, Providers receive a specific object that uh, allows them to listen to other providers. So um, um, we see this ref object as it, that is passed as parameter to our provider. And we can use this ref object to um, call a uh, watch, which is similar to the uh, watch methods that we saw on consumer widget previously, that allows the provider to listen to uh, other providers. So it's able to obtain the user repository, and then we can we can create uh, an instance of our business object and pass the user repository to the business object. And one of the interesting benefits is that if somehow uh, the user repository could change over time, uh, the change of the VR provider here, the uh, business logic object, will be able to automatically update when the dependency is listening to is updating. So it's making sure that you're not out of that. Um, it's also worth something that um, tests still do not share state. Uh, while the providers are global, uh, the state is not stored inside uh, the provider. It's stored inside uh, the provider scope, which is that I mentioned previously, which means that if you make two tests, um, no test will be no state will be shared between tests, so you don't need any any tier off whatsoever, which makes testing a lot easier. Similarly, you can do some mocking uh, if you want to um, using this provided scope widget we saw previously. We can pass an extra parameter to override the behavior of some providers. So here we are overriding the providers that exposed um, a repository object to our application. So by overriding this provider. 
um, the application will suddenly um, potentially fake HTTP request. Um, we can also have access to advanced features like proper refresh. So for example, you could define a provider and inside your consumer widget, um, you could use ref the refresh indicator widget, which is based directly inside iFlyer, which handles this loading spinner and this slide motion. And then inside the on refresh callback that is called when the user uh, drags down, you can simply call context.refresh and pass up the provider that you want to refresh. And that will automatically recreate the state of the provider. So if somehow the counter was incremented, it would reset to zero. And so it's, it's a very easy way to handle uh, refresh indicators uh, in a single line of code. Uh, finally, um, another thing you can easily do is um, automatically destroying the state of providers when they are no longer in use, which is one of the um, main additions of Proverbal. So here, simply by adding uh, dot auto dispose to the provider, that tells Riverbot that the provider should be destroyed. Uh, the set of the provider should be destroyed when it's no longer listened by the UI. So, uh, so as soon as you remove all the widgets that are listening to the counter, the counter will be destroyed. And the next time you try to access the counter, the state will reset to the initial value. Um, yeah, that can be very useful to, uh, uh, you know, uh, remove some, uh, uh, re release some resources like maybe Firebase, which can be costly. So um, now let's see some simple examples around how to specifically use a report in, in real world applications. So here we're trying to make a simple login page. Uh, so it has a login page and password, uh, lo login and password. So we could, what we could do is we could uh, declare two providers to that will both store um, specifically the uh, login and the password, which is uh, just two strings. Um, and then we can create some UI that creates text fields. And when the uh, text field is updated inside the on-change, we can update the provider with the updated text, which then allows us to, um, yeah, on change, uh, which then allows us to, yeah, sorry, uh, one step before is, we then create a rise button to somehow have this submit logic. But if we have a submit button, we likely want to uh, disable the submit button uh, until we both specify the login and the password. So for this, one of the naive approach would be to obtain both the login and the password inside the build method. And then if both strings are not empty, uh, we don't show the right button. Uh, well, we disable the right button. So that will work, but it actually has one issue where um, it will cause the widget, the widget to rebuild too often. But that I mean, if you're typing, um, if you have uh, uh, filled your, both your login and your password, but you're typing on the password field, that will still cause the form to rebuild, which is not desired considering the button state doesn't change. Hey, Remy, um, I would like yeah. to inform you that we have five minutes left till the end of your speech, oh. until the beginning of our Q&A session. OK, I'll speed up a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, and I, I think I'll skip the next example. So, yeah, so uh, what the basic idea is to extract um, this logic inside a separate provider. So here, just provider and use the watch meter to and then listen to it inside your build method, which will automatically filter through builds that I mentioned before. This way, the widget will build only if the can login state change and not any time you type on the field. Uh, so yeah, that's, um, yeah. <clears throat> and then finally, you uh, save this, on, on click, you save the state of your user inside the separate provider so that you can use it inside your UI. Um, yeah, and I wanted to show an infinite list, but I guess we don't really have the time to uh, go through it. Uh, yeah, so uh, maybe any question later. Um, I guess. 
because then it probably be too long to explain. So I guess thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you, Remy. Thank you so much. Okay, it was a great talk, and now we are welcoming to join us actually uh, Thomas and Majid. I guess are they already waiting? So let's invite them. Hi. Hi. Hi, hi everyone again. It's really nice to see you again here. And I also know that all of you are actually also the members of our program committee for this amazing event. And you are actually the people who are helping us with uh, creating this event and make it memorable. So I would like to thank you for this. Thank you so much for being a part of it and for preparing. So I think we can ask with, we can start with questions and we can start asking you. So first of all, uh, everyone, I will ask all the attendees. So please, you can write down your questions right now. We are going to start the, our Q&A session and our discussion. So, uh, first of all, I know there was uh, a question on the, uh, during the time of Thomas' speech. There was like, has uh, Flutter advantages with React Native? I'm going to put the questions right there. And I know that Thomas already actually shared his thoughts regarding this with our attendees. So I would like also to hear, first of all, Majid, maybe you can also answer this. Uh, yes, uh, well, Thomas said uh, a few, uh, like, most important part that probably all I can also emphasize on that. But apart from that, no, I'm not kidding. Seriously, Flutter is better. It's just better. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, of course, we are there, Next question. <laughs> you know, just uh, give it a try. I mean, so I, I uh, for 10 minutes or less, I just live coded. So you saw that in 10 minutes, like how to reloading and stuff. And some people mentioned in the chat, oh, I didn't know Flutter is that easy. Like, seriously, it is easy. You just give it a try. <laughs> and, and then you see that it's just better. And that's it. <laughs> so that's okay. my opinion. I mean, you, you need to figure out, you know, uh, like if I want to say it seriously. So as a developer, sometimes you have a taste so you need to give it a try these two framework and see like which one is your taste and sometimes when you start developing with maybe flutter or react native you figure out if you don't try the other one you don't know you know so you need to give it a try build something maybe similar in both and then you realize oh maybe this one is better than another one that's at least one thing that i can say in terms of your taste of development but technical stuff, of course, Remy and uh, Thomas, Thomas already mentioned a couple of them. Remy will probably emphasize some of them. But uh, short answer, Flutter is better. Longer answer, give it a try and you see it's better. <laughs> okay, thank you. Remy, what do you think? Um, yeah, um, yeah, definitely. Uh, I definitely agree with this statement. Um, but if you want some concrete uh, benefits, between uh, Fur and React sure. Native, I would say um, that it definitely has a very good tooling, I would say. That's one of the major benefits we really, really quickly see when trying uh, when trying uh, Fur. Um, the tools work by default as you would expect them to do to, to work. Like if you want to build the application, you don't have to make hundreds of uh, lines of configurations just do flutter build and it's building and it has tree shaking it has potential minification it has a bunch of stuff like if without having to care about anything um so that definitely makes the experience a lot smoother um especially considering it's type too so um if you have obvious bugs of if you maybe upgrade a package um by upgrading the package since you're not using javascript um uh, if the package introduces a breaking chance chances are that the compiler will spot it so once again, it makes the experience smoother. Um, so yeah, uh, then you, you also get the hot trade out that really works. Uh, like for example, if you just react for a long time, uh, it improved recently, but um, 
originally uh, their equivalent of patch readout had many issues. It made, in many situations, it made a full refresh, whereas in Flutter, it always works all the time. Uh, it's really built directly inside Flutter, uh, so uh, it's very reliable. And then if you want to get really more technical, um, I would say that um, one of the most amazing things with Flutter is uh, its layout engine. Um, it's very performant by default and makes uh, applications, AUIs uh, almost responsive, almost responsive just by writing the code. Like one of the most amazing things in Flutter is you can publish, publish your code to the web, but you can send, actually center things on the web. Whereas if you wanted to try HTML, <laughs> good luck with centering things. <laughs> um, so, um, and you even, you even get uh, pixel perfect um, cross platform. Like um, if you wanted to use for a Rack Native, and if you um, try to make some UI between platforms, chances are you have some small differences between UIs, which may some cause, which may cause some overflows or different and desired behavior in platforms. Whereas in Flutter, it's so pixel perfect that you could have Cupertino design on the Android. Uh, so yeah. Okay, thank you. So what would you suggest, like how to start learning Flutter? If it's that easy, how to start doing it? What to use? It's question for everyone. So maybe Thomas, you would like to answer it first? Yeah, it uh, depends a little bit uh, what your background is. Uh, for I, Because we have uh, another language again, we have Dart. And, uh, but if you have any C style language, so with curly braces and the stuff, um, it's fairly easy um, to get, getting started. The biggest uh, obstacle for JavaScript people, I guess, is that we now have, they have to use types. Um, but very soon, if you get a little bit used to it, you will appreciate it because it really saves you from a lot of runtime errors. Um, and uh, the learning curve is itself from the, uh, from the framework. I really have to say it's surprisingly easy. It's not. It's not. It's, it's not trivial. You, you you know you know you, you need to know how to how to write a program in a real programming language. Yeah. What what I mean with this, uh, if you only have done HTML and CSS, you will have more effort to learn. But if you had uh, experience with any ob object oriented language. It's really easy. If I compare it with Xamarin, which I did before, um, the learning curve is much lower with uh, with Flutter, and you get, for, especially you get quicker results. Alone with alone really hot restart, you can do a lot of with try and error. Just change something, and oh yeah, okay, this is not just what I wanted. I change 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 it back, um, and um, yeah, and it's a very supportive community. If any uh, if anybody has problems. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Okay, Majid, what do you think? Uh, yeah, Thomas made a very good point. Uh, but also, I can say that, uh, you know, I personally usually learn by doing. So I suggest that you just, I don't know, pick some idea and start doing that with Flutter. And then once you just continue doing that idea and building your app, you learn uh, more and more and more. The first obstacle perhaps for everyone who doesn't know a new language or new framework and they want to come and learn that is just the beginning of that. Like you need to start first and doing something and then you can just move on afterwards. So I can just say, do not scare. As I also showed in my simple life coding, it's fairly simple to start. Just start and then pick some project, some ideas, doing that, you will learn more. That's great. Thank you, Majid. Remy? Uh, yeah, once again, I definitely agree with the statements. Um, like, I think um, the, uh, the board brought up interesting points about trying uh, trying directly uh, and changing things uh, and you learn things, learning things uh, easily. And, I think that's where uh, Flutter is really good at it too, where not only Flutter is relatively easier than uh, other alternatives, um, the, the tooling make it 
uh, easier to try a uh, blur. So you get the other outro, for example, which makes um, trying different things relatively smooth. You can change your code and see the outcome directly in milliseconds. Uh, so, that, so that, that's one thing. But you also, um, since you're, um, since Dark is strongly typed, um, you get auto completion, for example, which is very important to uh, to learn new things. You can see, oh, it has this method, it's interesting. And not only you see the different methods, you also see the documentation of the code too, because not only you see the list of methods, you see the dark dog that is uh, associated with it. Um, and uh, so, yeah. Um, yeah, you see, you get both of things. I wanted to bring on a third <laughs> point, but I forgot it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. OK. OK, I, thank you so may much. I, may I just add, uh, it's really sure. two things that Remy said with the tooling. It's really the thing. You just, you just install it according to the uh, readme, and you can start. And then just do the, uh, uh, the, um, uh, the beginner tutorial on the Flutter Dev website. Uh, alone with this, you, you get a feeling for what how it works, and from there, then there is another uh, layout tutorial and a very good one. This were the first the two things that I did, and then I tried my own stuff. This is Remy. Yeah, yeah, I, I remembered what I wanted to say previously too. Um, <laughs> yeah, you have these kind of lives online too. Now that we have Flutter Web, you can try for directly from the web, uh, and um, and also yes, um, yes please. You can, uh, I'll go to the definitions of the different functions and see the source code if you need to, uh, which is something you're not able to do in the JavaScript world because everything is minified, compiled, whatever, so it's unreadable. Whereas in Flutter, you can open the source code of Flutter and see if all things work. So it makes playing around easier. OK. Uh, we have next question by Vitaly Sorokin. <laughs> so. <laughs> Okay, I think there is something funny about this question. I would like to know. <laughs> this is this um, is a common question, like everyone asks us. Yeah, <laughs> I have I haven't met any tech stack where so much discussion about state management. Is. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I think this question is something that everyone would like to hear about. Then always, yeah. I think. And also, Remy and I, we both have. More or less competing packages. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so we we both we, we are a little bit biased, my maybe if we uh, if we say what is what is the best approach. Yeah, and I reckon I'm also competing with myself too. <laughs> <laughs> right. I have multiple I have multiple stage management packages, so technically <laughs> my different packages are competing um, with themselves. <laughs> yeah. But uh, especially if we if we compare mine and and and, and uh, Remy's, it's really a, much a, a matter of taste. What you what what feels more comfortable for you? What is the way that that you like? Um, so, for example, obviously, I would re recommend get it together with the get it mixing. Um, and uh, you have to check the, what other functionality do you get with with the state management because uh, every package has a little bit of some special goodies. And um, uh, yeah, Remy probably will more the, the yeah. river pod or. Um, I mean, I would say river pod is pretty better because it has some extra layers of safety and it makes things. It has a slightly de de better default behavior. It makes things easier for newcomers. Um, but then, I mean. As long as you understand the different pros and cons of each approach, uh, your decision is fine, whatever it is. It's just um, the difficulty is in, in, is in really understanding the pros and cons of each approach. It's very easy to blindly trust uh, what some package says and or forget some downsides and uh, realize the mistake only later in the project. So first make sure that the packages do what you want them to do. It's fine if you're not using the mainstream things, if you have your reasons, but make sure you have your reasons. Mm. Yeah, that's, okay. that's also an important point that we um, yeah, we already see a lot of fragmentation with a lot of, lot, lot of different packages. And we have some packages, three or four, that I would call main, mainstream. 
Um, and so uh, if you want to make it easy for new developers to onboard on your team, I think it's probably good to take one of the mainstreams. OK, great. Majid, maybe you would like to add something to this? Well, are you asking me to talk about the state management in front of two uh, solid rocket <laughs> developers who are making <laughs> state management libraries? Uh, but uh, apart from kidding, uh, it's uh, like here Thomas said, sometimes it's like a taste again. So you need to give it a try. There are some uh, packages. I personally use both Thomas and Remy's packages in two different uh, projects completely separated, I use both. And I enjoy both of them. So, and I always want to have two projects to use both of them. <laughs> so it's hard to choose one. <laughs> okay, but, uh, that's great. <laughs> but there are some others like block and other patterns, flux and redux. So you need to give it a try and see, for, you need to evaluate your project, see how big is that, how scalable you want to be, and those type of things, and then try one of these packages for sure. Okay, thank you. And now our next question. So, uh, some Google experts don't like the freedom on Flutter. Since Android provides some architecture guideline like uh, MVVM, what can you tell to this person? Mm. Thomas, you can start. <laughs> I'm super you phrase it, maybe. I'm not sure. I'm not 100% sure what it uh, what it means. Um, I, my guess is um, that uh, in Android, there's more or less one uh, recommended approach, and everyone does it. Kind of is this true? Does this match? I don't. I, I haven't. I haven't. I, I don't. I haven't done an, an, um, native Android. Um, I think the. Yeah, the biggest difference is uh, because the way uh, we, uh, Flutter creates its UI compared to Android. If you um, define an Android uh, with the um, uh, with uh, your UI in, with, uh, in the markup in markup language, you need some sort of binding to code. Why you? That's why MVVM is so uh, is, is used there. Um, but uh, Flutter uses a completely different. Um, uh, way to do uh, 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 to update its UI, so um, it's more or less MVU would be the the the, the, the closest uh, uh, pattern that matches, and uh, inside this, um, yeah, you have different approaches how how you want to structure your app. Um, for example, I definitely don't recommend using or or forcing MVVM on a on, fl on a Flutter project. It's just uh, not a really good match yeah um there are better options i guess okay thank you majid um like uh, thomas said i also haven't done uh, native android i am not uh, very into the community and what is the mainstream over there and what is the recommended way but what i can say is like when you come to flutter you just need to follow also the flutter uh, things. <laughs> it's it's all about everything. It's about architecture. It's about coding. The way you you manage your code and style. This might be different from another you know uh, a system. Like if you're coming from iOS or maybe from Android. So you need to stick on that uh, specific platform for for say and and follow that as well. Which might not be like for for instance MVVM is not probably a very popular way of uh, doing that in 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 Flutter for sure. Okay, thank you, Remy. Would you like to add something? Uh, yeah, I mean, um, technically, if, you, if you're looking for um, the Google recommended way uh, equivalent, uh, I mean, in Flutter. Uh, Google is recommending provider. Um, so technically that would be the equivalent, I guess. Um, but yeah, there's still some fragmentation in the community where many people use block, many people use Mobix too, or get it, whatever. Um, okay. But we still have, we still have a relatively uh, 
we still have a very limited number of mainstream packages. We don't have like hundreds of them. We, we may have hundreds of packages, but many of them are not really used at all. It's just they're there and you forget about them. Two people use them. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you. And now we are having one more question to Remy. What is main advantages of Riverprod in comparison with JTX package? Um, I mean, I personally don't quite like it. If you want to use it, <laughs> um, generally, my uh, the reason I dislike JTX is because it doesn't promote good practices, I would say, at least, pers at least what's my feeling personally. Um, I tend to prefer some code that is uh, testable by default and that is um, as uh, strict and, and robust as possible by default, so that it prevents as much mistakes as, uh, as possibly uh, uh, as possible, um, whereas um, Getix has a different approach where it tries to remove as much boilerplate as possible uh, to make everything almost a, a one liner if possible. Um, it's a different approach. I mean, if 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 is if that's your thing, whatever. Um, it's just not not my thing personally. Okay, thank you. And now our next question. So we spoke a lot about no code or less code, but how about info security of apps? What do you suggest for new developers? What rules you must follow to develop Flutter? Uh, who would like to start? Maybe Majid? Um, I, I'm not sure about the question. The question is start from no code, less code, but then it's talking about like, uh, all right, but I, I can uh, maybe answer a quick question uh, sure. quickly. So um, my suggestion is to follow the best practices, which are already there, uh, written by uh, amazing people like Thomas, Remy and sure. other people in the community and also recommended by Google and Flutter team itself. So perhaps uh, if you want to if you want to follow a flut uh, like develop a flutter app the best thing is to get familiarized with all of these best practices first and then you know what to do afterwards that's for me probably the first step you need to go ahead and uh, learn them first um maybe thomas and remy can uh, have some more comments on that for sure yes you please thomas um, I, I guess it's really the point uh, of the question is info security of apps. Um, you, uh, you have to um, actually it's not so, not so different than uh, from other apps. Apps, um, the uh, it might be um, if you if you look that uh, it uh, Flutter uh, does not um, does uh, compile directly to. Um, uh, processor binary uh, it might be harder to uh, uh, to uh, re-engineer than if you have a uh, trusty bytecode from uh, uh, from a Java project or JavaScript. Um, otherwise, uh, it's really you had you have to uh, to care for everything like you do uh, with uh, uh, with other with other apps. Yeah, so um, I'm. Yeah, actually, it may be, for example, uh, it may even be, it be a little bit more secure, but perhaps Remy can co correct me there, um, as it does not use the operating system uh, text edit fields, for example. Um, I think it's uh, more difficult to uh, to snoop inside from, from from the outside to get the content of a um, of a text field, for example, um, which I in Windows, for example, is with, uh, pro uh, without problems possible. Um, if you have a password field, for example, that you want to make sure nobody gets the password uh, in this way, because Flutter cross everything itself, yeah. So um, it's not uh, that uh, you won't get uh, that easy any tool or so that uh, that that does this for you. But otherwise, don't know what uh, what would be important. Okay, thank you, Remy. Would you like to add something um, to this, maybe? Well. I'm not really an expert on security, so 
don't listen to me. Uh, if anything, uh, I know that uh, Telecom Online has a few flags for uh, like not only minifying the code, but also obfusca obf obfuscating the code, including the, the dark code. So it removes the symbols and combines stack press and some like that. So you can look at this. But yeah, that's clear. OK. And we have our next questions. I think it's uh, to Remy. Yes, it's about Riverprod. So for Riverprod, all the logic and behavior of the UI would be global. Uh, can you repeat the question? <laughs> <laughs> yes, sure. If uh, for Riverprod, all the logic and behavior of the UI will be global. Yes or no? Yes and no. Um... In some sense, I can understand uh, why you would think it's global, uh, as most widgets would be able to access this type. Um, but in, if you want to be uh, pedantic about uh, how it works, uh, it's technically not global. Uh, it may look global for you, depending on your definition. Um, but uh, there, are, there are, for example, some situations where uh, it's not possible to access the state of the widget, depending on where you are in the application. Where, whereas, as opposed to because global with global, you can access them from absolutely everywhere. Um, uh, it's just a it's relatively complex topic, so it's difficult to explain overally without some examples to showcase uh, this uh, situation. But in short term, if you know what uh, what that is, um, about um, promote something called uh, unidirectional data flow, uh, which means uh, the graph of dependency between providers have to, re to respect a very strict uh, interaction. So you cannot have spaghetti code, I would say. You cannot access a, a global fibers from certain everywhere. Uh, okay. <laughs> OK, thank you. And next questions from Samir. OK, easiest way to perform background tasks in Flutter. How close can we get to Native Work Manager? Uh, Majid, I would like to start with you. I think Thomas should start on this, perhaps. So, <laughs> Honestly, okay. I have, I have you want to start, one, Thomas? Just one, uh, one question where uh, I also would more or less pass. There, I know there is a package if you want to use the uh, the Work Manager. But I haven't used it yet, so I can't say anything about it. Maybe Remy knows something. Yes. OK, who <laughs> would continue? Remy? Yeah. Mm, I don't really have anything to say. I haven't tried my class. OK, I think that's <laughs> 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 okay. Probably, I guess, that's it from this question, probably. Okay, let's continue. Here we go. So, Riverport use consumer widget, or with hook use hook widget. And in getting mixing and mixing, this is like hacking framework. Zeta powerful, but seems changing in flutter behavior. Um, I, I guess where you're going. Um, I mean, uh, I understand what you mean by this like. You, you, uh, it somehow feels like we are uh, going away from how Flutter naturally is used, which is a fair concern. But at the same time, um, it's not exactly that far. Like for example, the widget that you mentioned, or consumer widget, or uh, to get it mixed in, they're just a different variant of stateless widget in, in, in a sense. They just have one extra tiny functionality. Um, so in the end, it's not really like a completely new thing uh, in Flutter. Um, but yeah, in the end, I still agree with you. I think um, I've discussed about it with the Flutter team for hours uh, about maybe having something similar to hooks in Flutter directly so that we wouldn't have to make our own on our side. Um, we don't have any existing uh, solution for this yet, so we have to make our own. Uh, maybe in the future we will. Who knows? Um, maybe 
maybe you could say we are we are uh, hacking a little bit of framework uh, because we needed to find some some hook to where we can yeah hold our our, uh, our data that we need for to do this so uh, but on the other side what we are doing nowhere in the documentation is written it's we shouldn't do this and uh, <laughs> everything is open and documented so um, i don't think it's uh, there's a real problem i mean in fact it's more the opposite where uh, I think the, uh, the text lead of uh, Flutter I mentioned uh, earlier today is that it's actually one of the, uh, this, uh, this, it's actually by design that all of these things are possible. Mm -hmm. uh, they could have prevented it, but they made sure that people could make advanced stuff if they wanted to. So um, yeah, that's an example of uh, an actual use case for how Flutter is open. Okay, thank you. And we have one more question. Do you use any ORM packages? I'm not sure to who exactly addresses this question, but... <laughs> I, I, best for to Madrid, wahrscheinlich, I, I guess, from the type of, 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 uh, of, of, of projects you are doing. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, in, I mean, my project, well... What do we use? Um, I need to think a little bit about it. I, I don't think we use any, at least external packages, maybe. Um, yeah, I, I don't remember right now exactly, but I can, when you answer, I can quickly check one of the project and I can say like, if you are using anything in specific, because we have a lot of actually custom I, I know it seems a little bit odd, but uh, in, in the, the, the two projects that I am in right now, we have a lot of custom stuff which the team has made by himself. And the mm -hmm. reason is that when we started the project, we started about um, a year and a half or maybe two years ago when the first stable version was announced. Uh, and there was no, there was not a lot of packages at that time. So this is just recently that you see a lot of packages. So we mm. had to develop a lot of stuff by ourselves. And once we, we moved forward, then we find out uh, like good packages, let's say get it comes and provider, you know, is there, river part is there. Then we are trying to refactor part of our application with these packages to make our life easier. We don't need to develop everything by ourselves. So when smarter people like Thomas and <laughs> Remy are there to, to create such a great packages, then why not using that? <laughs> and uh, that's the reason. So, but I don't have anything right now on top of my mind for that particular question. I haven't really seen a full arm in this thing i think one of the reasons is uh, that we don't have ref reflections so we we would have to rely on code generation um the most popular way i guess currently is more m-o-o-r um to access sqlite and um also uh it's interesting it's very it's 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 really worth to have a look an object box which is an object library um, so you actually, you don't really use an ORM, um, but that's all what I can uh, say at the moment. I don't know if, if Remy has stumbled over a, a real ORM in, uh, in, in Flutter yet. No, not as far as I know. I guess, I guess the reason why this is that m most people or many, many people, um, directly connect to Firestore. Um, and um, because this is what's, uh, what's also everywhere shown how to do it, and it's it's really easy. Um, and then you don't need an ORM. Um, you just serialize your uh, uh, to JSON, and that that's it. I think you're missing. I mean, do can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Okay, Remy, do you have something to add? No, not really. Yeah. No. Okay. So we actually have one more question that somehow about React Native. <laughs> so can React Native perform multi-thread? Uh, 
maybe you can answer it i think um i think it depends on i mean i'm not an arachnid expert so i can definitely be wrong uh, so double check what i said but javascript uh, is not multi-threaded so i'm pretty sure that from the javascript side you will not be able to multi threading um but you can interact with the native at least you interact with the native more than with player and the native can have threads so you can have threads there uh, so you could definitely kind of do uh, some hacking around it to uh, have some form of multi trading from the JavaScript side by interacting with the native. Okay, mm, Majid, Thomas, maybe you have something to add to this? No, not to uh, to react. Like we could also uh, only tell how how did, how it's an, on uh, on Flutter and Dart. Yeah, I'm not um, sure why this question actually <laughs> was uh, asked uh, here. But... And there it is. Uh, it's pretty easy. Dart itself is single threaded, which is very nice. It solves a lot of problems, uh, but which it, 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 this doesn't uh, this doesn't uh, mean that you can't split your work onto several threads. The thing is, uh, you have to uh, to use it's called isolates, um, which uh, can't directly access uh, date variables from the from uh, from another isolate. So uh, you have to uh, to uh, to, um, um, to to push your data um, uh, more or less with uh, some serializer from outside in, into this into into the isolate and back. Um, but for example, it's quite common to use an uh, isolate for uh, deserializing the uh, JSON when it gets when you get get it from the uh, or, or you actually you make your um, you make your rest call already in the other isolate, um, deserialize, and then um, uh, transfer your objects uh, to the other uh, to your main app. Um, that's quite uh, quite often used. Okay, Majid. Yeah, um, I think I would agree on the React Native. I'm also not an expert in React Native, just did oh, some really? small projects. So I think I would agree with uh, Remy on that part. Uh, the JavaScript part <sighs> by nature is single threaded. So, and the Dart part, Thomas also said how we can do that. So nothing else to add. Okay, great. I think we don't have any more questions for the moment. Uh, please, anyone, if you still have questions, we still have some time. So please, you can add uh, questions. Meanwhile, I would... the... Yes, sure. Uh, one of the things that uh, just came to my mind um, for sure. the question at the beginning, what the advantages of Flutter is. Um, one thing is, for example, um, uh, it's actually, it's uh, still quite new. Um, you can directly call from Flutter C libraries. So if you have a library in C code um, that you want to use, it's absolutely trivial to access this. Um, I don't know if, it's, if this is possible in React, for example, or how easy this is, this is in React. Um, in Flutter, this was an, uh, a real great addition to do. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. Actually, now we have a few more questions right oh. now, period. Yes. And here go the first one. Does Flutter for web any chance to be useful for web app? I know web is in beta, but approach of Flutter for web is not very good for web. It has scroll lag and very bad performance, I guess, when grow up. So what do you think about this? Mm. I mean, it kind of depends on uh, what web you're using with her. Um, like, uh, web has multiple approach that they are testing. Like, they tested two different things. Uh, they tested uh, converting widgets into DOM uh, with divs and whatever, and um, the equivalent in CSS for your layout. Um, but, you know, DOM is slow. Um, so uh, that's, that's the default behavior that you can currently see in, in the web. So that's why your scroll is slow, especially considering it's not relying on the native API for browsers to handle scrolling. It's actually doing this scroll in Dart. Uh, so it's a lot slower than uh, you know, the C++ sites that Chrome does it for you. Um, 
but they also have an experimental flag that's their exper uh, that's they're experimenting with because it's an experimental flag um uh for rendering with a web uh, using canvas uh, which makes things significantly smoother because you avoid all of this dumb issue and you focus only on what you want and it makes it yeah definitely faster um i'm not sure if scoring is um if, if we still have some uh, junk in the uh, uh, with scroll when using uh, the Canvas SPI, it's, it's possible considering we're still not relying on the native um, browser rendering for scrolling. But uh, uh, from what I've seen, um, like uh, we can do many performance animations with the Canvas API and actually have potentially better performance um, and maybe even likely better performance than one using DOM. So it's something I would look at. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Oh, we have a few more questions. So we have a few more minutes left till there. And so I think we can answer two, three, I think two questions. So here we go. Uh, will React Native and Flutter replace native development? Uh. <laughs> okay, let's start with Majid. Should I take the, I... the hate on you? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think each of them has uh, their own use cases. I am, well, I, I, at least uh, not in the foreseeable future, I don't think uh, they will replace native development, but for sure uh, a vast majority of apps can be developed with Flutter or React Native. So which doesn't need to be developed with native uh, development, you know? So, but still there are use cases that might need to, might need you to develop, you know, an app with Swift or, or uh, Kotlin or Java directly. Yeah. Uh... Is, I can see that. I, I think I think too, it's, uh, there are cases where will you where you need it, but just from a cost point of view, it's so clear that uh, more and more uh, apps will be uh, uh, developed in uh, as cross-platform. And uh, one nice thing I don't know if uh, if you are aware of this, you can even mix them, so you can uh, put native views into a Flutter app and Flutter views into a native app. So uh, if you want to, um, uh, to continue an existing project or there is some, some, some uh, special native widget that you, knew, you need, you can import this into Flat. OK, thank you. Remy, would you like to add something? I mean, the short answer would be uh, we don't know because we can't really <laughs> predict the future. Um, the long answer would be, um, I think it's reasonable to say that if Flutter doesn't win the war, at, ver at the very least, it will have some influence on what will be the future winner. Because from an objective point of view, um, Flutter is definitely easier and better designed, I would say, than uh, the other alternative. It's a much better developer experience than, than everything I've seen. And I've tried many things. Um, so uh, I don't see any reason why this wouldn't become the standard for future uh, technologies. So maybe Android will become even better than Flutter, Flutter and maybe Android itself will support some, some form of Cross platform, maybe Kotlin cross platform, I don't know. Uh, we can't really predict the future. Uh, but at the very least, I'm pretty sure that Flutter would have inspired uh, these technologies. I mean, we can already see it with Jetpack Compose or with Swift UI. We know that they took inspiration from React and Flutter. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. I think we are running out of time, even though we have a few more questions there. I would like to thank you, Remy, Thomas, Majid, all of you. Thank you for your contribution to our event. Thank you for being the part of our program committee. And thank you for your amazing and informative talks. I'm sure everyone enjoyed it as much as I did. 
and I wish you to have a great day, evening ahead, and stay safe. You Thank too. you very much. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Bye. And I hope you see you soon at our next events. <laughs> yeah, sure. Actually, maybe maybe we we uh, we just jump over to YouTube, and if there are some questions, we can maybe uh, answer them there. Yes, yeah, sure, of course. Fantastic idea. That would be great. <laughs> okay. Bye. 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 Okay, guys. Thank you for watching us. Thank you for being with us. I'm sure you're enjoying this uh, amazing session. So now we are having a short 10 minutes break. And uh, before that, I would like you to inform you about our upcoming events, which will be next week. So Python Universe Web Edition Global Summit is going to be an outbreak event with the speakers from famous companies like Netflix, TikTok, and Facebook. During the event, you will learn how to build data dashboards quickly, all about logging with Python, what's new in Python 3.9 and beyond, how to use SQL Alchemy in BI, this and much more on our Python Universe Web Edition Global Summit on the 19th of November. Register now with the cross 20 promo code to get 40% off from the current price admission. You can see the QR code right now on your screen, so follow it and hope to see you soon.